sound check check mic one two test mic let me just double check if we're live on facebook now there you go it's the 15th anniversary special of 9.09 and for tonight we're going to feature the senior lecturers the head coaches of 9.09 er and as promised we'll be giving away a total of 20 sets of well 10 books and 10 review packages. Before we proceed, I'll just copy the link and I'll send it to various group chats of our reviewees so that they can participate. What do we do? We uh, what do we expect you to do? Kindly tag minimum of five friends whom you think might be interested to watch our live event for tonight because from these active live viewers, we're going to pick the 20 lucky winners. So while I send the link to the various group chats, I'll ask Sir Fritz to greet our live viewers and do a little introduction of what's expected for tonight. Sir Fritz. Hello, yes, yeah, Sir Irvin, thank you. And of course, good evening to everyone. Uh, to uh, Of course, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone, no matter which part of the world you're from. So my name is Fritz. Uh, you can call me Fritz. Um, I, of course, am a senior lecturer of IELTS and uh, Niner, 9.0 Niner. And of course, for today, uh, we have uh, a lot of like what else, special things that were in store for you. Uh, for one, we're going to see a uh, live simulation of the speaking test for IELTS, uh, courtesy, of course, of our uh, legendary Niner, uh, Mr. Philip Aitona. And of course, we'll also have some on-the-spot writing sessions uh, with, of course, our, um, our, our, our very own Brian Shawson as well. And uh, each one of us would have varying roles. Um, later, as you'll see, I'll pretend to be the examiner of Philip and uh, then uh, some other lecturers. Uh, I think uh, Marlon Viardo, of course, one of our lecturers as well, uh, will also be doing some feedback. And just like what Irvin mentioned earlier, so guys, uh, make sure that you tag your friends, especially those who are, who are interested in taking the IELTS OET uh, test in the next coming months. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's just make this uh, event, uh, well, productive. So there. So, yeah. So uh, perhaps we can share a bit more of nine, my, what 9.09er is all about. So, guys, we're actually celebrating our 15th year uh, for today. Uh, I mean, I've been with the company since it started. Uh, I recall like back in 2007. So we started at a very small uh, office located uh, along Kesson Avenue. Then from then on, uh, with, uh, with the word of mouth, with, of course, uh, people flocking in, and, of course, with, uh, with the proud uh, roster of past as well. So we, of course, proliferated. And during this pandemic, uh, we were able to extend our market as we were able to tap into online reviews yeah, to be able to access uh, no matter like which part of the world you're from. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, reviewees from the Middle East. And recently also, of course, we, we have welcomed uh, other nationalities as well. So we do have non-Filipinos uh, also doing our online classes, attending online classes and doing our coaching sessions as well. Okay, so there. So, um, well, of course, we we'd also would like to uh, some books we're offering. Uh, it's available on, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, can someone confirm with me, is it available in Lazada or just in Shopee at the moment? Shopee. Shopee. A Shopee, a Shopee. So there. So we do have, uh, we, we actually publish several books then, and we do have upcoming books. And uh, it's something that I actually look forward to because uh, I think the next book in line would be the one that I authored. So I'm quite, uh, you know, fortunate to have this opportunity as well. So there, right. So uh, in a few uh, minutes. Yeah, so we'll take we'll, we'll go over again with the speaking and writing sessions. And I'd like to turn this over to Irvin first. Uh, Irvin? Okay, I'm done sharing. 
the face uh, the link of our Facebook live session. And right now, I'd like to greet the 372 live viewers. We're hoping to have more viewers in the next few minutes with the help of that push notification to inform the others. Because there is something that you have to look forward to for tonight, knowing that Sir Philip will do an on-the-spot IELTS speaking and on-the-spot OET speaking. And Sir Brian is going to come up with two writing tasks on the spot, one for IELTS and one for OET. First, let me take a look at the messages or the comments of the live viewers. Most of them are happy 15th anniversary 9.09er. And here's Angelic May Aguilar tagging five of her friends, also Crispy Rivera. Let me take a look at the other comments. Most of them are greetings and tag. Okay. There you go. So for the first part, what we're going to do is, as promised, we're going to have the on-the-spot the on the IELTS speaking. So Sir Fritz Nolasco, our lecturer since 2007, so he's been with the company for 15 years already. He's going to play the role of IELTS examiner. Now, the IELTS examinee is Philip Edward Aitona, who took the IELTS and OET. Let me take a look. Uh, a total of three instances, okay? In his three attempts, he got the perfect grade of nine in IELTS speaking, perfect A in OET speaking, and another perfect A in OET speaking. So imagine 100% perfect score in all his three attempts in various English examinations. So you understand why? Is the perfect uh, lecturer to play the role of Examinee. And after that, Sir Marlon Viardo, our lecturer for six years, is going to evaluate the performance of Sir Philip. Now, before we start, I'd like to ask our live viewers, do you have any suggestion for the specific uh, topic or questions that you want Sir Philip to answer for tonight? Well, I'm looking at the Facebook uh, I mean, the comment section here on Facebook. And now, yeah, hey, we have 484 live viewers. Make that 499. Which topics would you like us to ask Sir Philip? Any suggestions, any questions? Because remember, guys, this is supposed to be on the spot. I'm waiting for the participation of our live viewers. This is the difference when you're just watching the recorded version versus the live and interactive version. Because if it's the live and interactive version, you get to suggest. You get to participate. Anyone? Any suggestion? Which topic you want Sir Philip to talk about in IELTS speaking? Yeah. Yes, I think, Irvin, um, as I see on the chat message, mm -hmm. someone is requesting for about globalization. Globalization. So maybe, Sir right. Fritz, you can include that in task three. Yeah, sure. Because yeah, I can incorporate. Globalization is a very broad topic. It could be in the context of culture, in the context of technology. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. Well, they're active. Okay. From Jade Saldana Kabakungan, for Sir Philip, alternative sources of energy. So, Sir Fritz, kindly think of questions related to alternative sources of energy okay. for task three. Okay, I'll wait for one more, one more suggestion or one more comment from our live viewers, and we'll begin with task one. For the benefit of those who have no idea what IELTS speaking is all about, it's further subdivided into three tasks. So task one, introduction and inter interview, that's likely to last for five minutes. No preparation time. The examinee is required to open his mouth right after the question is asked. Please be advised that in task one, it's totally up to the examiner to interfere or throw the next question. So please expect that not all candidates will be able to finish their responses in task one. So for five minutes, expect a total of three topics and three questions. So most likely that's a total of nine questions for task one alone. Moving on to task two, the individual long term. So the examiner is going to give the candidate a general task card. Say for instance, tell me something about the activity that you've done 
last weekend. So the examiner is going to give you one minute to prepare for your answer. You ask yourself all possible questions that are related to that general task card. And then you're supposed to talk uninterruptedly for one to two minutes. What happens if you fail to reach one minute? Expect a penalty. So what is the goal of all candidates? To reach the second minute. But guys, by the second minute, finished or not finished, you have to stop talking. Congratulations, you reached the finish line. Task three, two-way discussion is a lot like task one in a sense that the examiner is going to give you five minutes to answer follow-up questions. I've noticed the more complicated your responses are, the more that you're inviting the examiner to ask complicated or complex follow-up questions. That's why our suggestion is keep it simple in task two. Now, some of you might disagree with the response of the examinee or the candidate, but I'd like to highlight there is no moral judgment whatsoever of the responses of the candidate. It's what? The fluency, pronunciation, vocabulary plus grammar. They are the four criteria that examiners are going to assess in your performance. So these examiners will give you whole numbers as values in each of the four criteria. Now, it's not the examiner who's going to determine the grade that will come out in your IELTS result, but it's the computer. So what exactly does the computer do? Get the average of your grades in each of the four criteria. FYI, no fractions, no decimals. You're only given whole numbers as values. Okay, so we have 567 live viewers now who are excited for our first part, IELTS speaking on the spot. I'll turn you over now to Sir Philip and Sir Fritz. Thank you, Irvin. Okay, so guys, as mentioned by Irvin, then I'll be, uh, for this speaking practice, I'll be simulating, I'll pretend to be the examiner. And uh, of course, our, our, our student now, of course, is Philip. So he's going to ask, I'm going to ask questions. So this is the speaking test of the International English Language Testing System. Today is March 25, 2022. The examiner's name is Michael Fritz Nolasco and the examinee's name, Edward Aitona. Uh, may I ask for your ID, please, sir? Here it is. Okay. Sir. Right. Thank you. So, how do you want me to call you? Please call me Philip. Okay. All right. So, Philip, the first part of the test, I'll be asking you yourself about your work and as well as your hobbies and interests. So, I, I'd start with part one. Uh, do you work or study? I currently work as a lecturer at 9.0 Niner IELTS Review Center. It's a job that I've been doing for the past 14 years now. And it's something that truly gives me much joy and fulfillment. You see, sir, I help people prepare for the English tests, not only for the IELTS, but also for the OET. I prepare them in terms of their grammar, their vocabulary, their testing and strategies. And it's always been very delightful to see how my students' hard work translates into happy outcomes, not only for themselves, but for the people who count on them. Okay. All right. So, Philip, let's talk about the scheduling. I mean, do you work in a fix? Hello. I'm sorry, sir. Um, I did not hear that. Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. Right. So, Philip, yeah. So, the question was... Uh, on your at your work, uh, do you do shifting schedule or do you work on a fixed schedule? I work on a shifting schedule when I do uh, lectures online uh, because I mm. partly work from home. Uh, my lectures last from the afternoon to the evening. However, when I do face to face classes in a physical classroom, my lectures uh, last from the morning to the afternoon. I find this kind of um, different. Um, setups quite refreshing because it forces me to always know what time I'm supposed to wake up every morning and forces me to sleep early at night. It's something that it has always been a challenge for me and I'm glad that Niner helps me to rise up to the um, difficulty. 
Okay. All right. So, Philip, you mentioned about working from home then. And, you know, this has been the status quo for, for a lot of us over the past two years because of this pandemic. In your experience, do, do you find any benefits of working from home? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the primary benefit uh, in my case is not having to wake up very early because I struggled in the morning to um, attend and be on time for my classes. And if I work from home, the travel time from my bed to my lecture space is 10 seconds um, compared to um, the normal setup where I have to travel a certain distance, like 30 minutes or an hour. I, working from home has been a blessing that I hope would, would continue um, in the foreseeable future. Right, yeah. Now, restrictions have been easing up. Um, do you think that working from should be government strongly considered for most professionals, even after this pandemic? Definitely. The, quite a lot of industries have experienced significant profits by their, not only in terms of money, but more importantly, in terms of time because workers no longer have to travel such long distances and spend hours on traffic. They now can spend this time more productively, not only accomplishing their tasks at work, but also having downtime by being able to sleep more, having more time to eat and spend time with their families, helping to establish a better work-life balance. And this is a win-win situation for everyone, for the workers themselves, the companies, and society in general because we have a happier and more productive workforce. Okay, I'll have to move on to another topic. Uh, let's set aside work first and let's talk about your hobbies and interests. So how do you usually spend your spare time? Whenever I have spare time, I truly devote it to reading. Reading, after all, is what helps me maintain not only my skills, but also to upskill and to continue discovering new things. Learning is a lifelong process, and reading, in my experience, truly is the way to keep that going. Specifically, I like uh, reading articles from Rappler. It's an online news um, organization. Its CEO is Maria Ressa, the first Filipino Nobel Prize winner. And what I appreciate about it is that it's not only the wide range of topics that it covers, from politics to showbiz to the Koreans, but also the consistently high quality of its English, which truly helps me not only keep up with current events, but also to expand my own vocabulary. And this helps me in turn to share these blessings to my students as well. Okay. That's why I love reading. Right. Now, what about fiction? I mean, are you interested in fiction books? Oh, definitely. After all, fiction is a, lot, is a way for us to expand our imagination and to um, widen our perspective of what is possible. Nonfiction books allow us to understand the way things are. Fiction, on the other hand, allows us to uh, think about how things could be. And especially given the way that, that our society is going on right now, I think it is critical for us to expand our perspectives and to reimagine our society. How could we rearrange things so that um, our relations are more equal, are, more, are fairer, are more just? And this is a decision that we have to make every day. Fiction books, therefore, are something I would truly recommend to anyone. Okay, all right, that's the end of part one. So now I'll have to move on to part two then, Philip. So this is where I will be uh, giving you a question for part two then. I'll give you a minute to think about the topic, all right? So let me now first share my screen so at least uh, everyone else in the, on the Facebook Live would be able to see the question. All right, just give me one moment. Okay, uh, for some reason, I couldn't share my screen. But anyway, uh, for the sake of the audience and of course for Flip, I'll just have to read uh, the question here. Uh, so uh, the, the question, I'll just give me one moment to pull it out. 
Okay. So, uh, Philip, the question is about, uh, tell something about the kind of music you like. So, your answer to the music. Uh, second one, why you enjoy this type of music. And third, how important music is to your life. Okay. So, I'll, I'll just have to repeat it. And, of course, for, for everyone's sake, uh, the question is, tell something about the kind of music you like. Your answer should include, what is your favorite type of music? Why you enjoy this type of music? And how important music is to your life then? Okay? So I'll give you one minute to think about the topic first. Thank you. While Philip is preparing, I just like to mention that in the actual examination, the examiner is going to give you a scratch paper and a pen. You can use this to make an outline, which could actually be your guide while you're talking later on. There are certain instances, though, where the examiner and examinee are not in exactly the same room. Why? Because of COVID-19, the game has totally changed. The tables have turned. Which means to say, even if the examiner is not in front of you, there is an invigilator who is going to give you a scratch paper and pen so that you can still take note. In the actual examination, even if you are not together with the examiner in the same room, you are expected to wear a face mask. And this is exactly the reason why during your practices, I need you to wear a face mask. It's entirely different when you are talking without any barrier as compared to talking with face mask on, plus nervousness, anxiety, and so on. So I guess one minute preparation time is over. I'll turn yes. you back to Fritz and Philip. All right. Okay. So now, Philip, I will ask you to talk for two minutes then uh, regarding the topic, of course. Let me just reset my timer. All right. You can start talking. I don't really have a favorite kind of music. My the What I prefer doing and listening to is silence. Ever since I grew up, I have always found songs and all these chants, these things I hear on TV to be very distracting. I'd much rather just listen to the sound of my own voice. I, if I hear songs, for example, it, it forces me to pay attention to it, which is bad for whatever it is that I'm trying to do. I think that being focused in one's tasks is critical in order to achieve anything. And for me, music has always been uh, something that makes it harder for me to accomplish this. And I think that's perfectly fine because, whether, because what's important about music is not whether one has it in one's life or one doesn't have it in one's life, but rather that we know which one works best for us. The, it's a common pitfall for people to just do whatever it is that everyone else is doing, the bandwagon effect. And this is particularly common amongst, well, not only the youth, but our current times in which everyone is so interconnected in terms of TikTok and maybe YouTube and uh, Facebook and Instagram reels. We are bombarded with all kinds of songs, etc. And there is a great temptation to just do what everyone else does. For me, I have chosen to uh, walk the, un the untrodden path and to choose silence. This is what works for me. And hopefully other people would consider also being more deliberate in how they live the rest of their lives, but what, what kind of food they eat, what kind of clothes they wear, what kind of music to listen to, and what kind of music not to listen okay. to. Okay, time is up. All right, so thank you. So that's the end of part two. And now with part three, I'll be asking you some follow-up questions related to uh, whatever we covered for part, uh, for part two. So, uh, Philip, I'd like you to talk about the benefits that children can get when they're exposed to their parents to music at an early age. Does it benefit them? Well, as I just said, I think that that's a yes and a no. Some people uh, are able to use music in a beneficial way. Perhaps children can be energized in their tasks because of the rhythms and the beats that um, accompany their tasks. At the same time, music can also be a communal activity. If, when people sing songs together or go to karaoke bars or whatever, in which they feel a greater sense of connection and belongingness to their peers, 
And in that sense, music can indeed make it be very beneficial to kids. But at the same time, though, um, on the other hand, the music can be quite harmful because it can be very distracting. Instead of studying, they just spend time listening to songs. Or it's also possible that music is harmful more directly when they promote hate and um, problematic ideologies through their lyrics or through the lifestyle of their singers. So at the end of the day, parents must be discerning when in not only choosing what kind of music to expose their children to, but to be more vigilant in what kinds of music children are accessing on their own in their free time. Okay. Now, Korean music, let's talk about Korean music. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge hit. It's hugely popular among Filipino fans despite the language barrier. Can you explain that phenomenon? Why do you think it's hugely popular despite many people not being able to understand the language? Well, we are attracted to things in for various reasons become, because love comes in many forms. We don't always necessarily have to fully understand something or someone in order for this to be quite meaningful in our lives. It, in my understanding, as part of the attraction of Korean um, pop music is not only the music themselves, but rather the community that comes with it. Uh, K-pop stands, for example, uh, the army of BTS, they are quite united. They reach out to each other and they enjoy the music together. And uh, music is just like anything that, is, that delights us. It, joy is magnified when it is shared. And I think this is a huge part of why people all over the world, not only in the Philippines, are quite attracted to Korean uh, music even if they can't even pronounce the lyrics, but rather it's the people who they enjoy it with. Okay. All right. So, Philip, I'll, I'll just have to partly digress from the topic and let's talk about globalization then. And, well, in the Philippines, as a third world country, do you think that globalization, the impact of globalization, um, is more beneficial to the country? Or do you think that the consequences, consequences that come with it uh, outweighs the advantages? Well, just like any complex phenomenon, globalization has its upsides and downsides. For one thing, globalization allows us to have strong uh, allies across the board. Uh, just whether on an individual level or on a state level, we need to work with others in order for us to accomplish great things. Uh, one way that this manifests in the Philippine situation is the support that we have received um, in standing up to China against their incursions in the West Philippine Sea by having a multilateral approach, uh, peaceful diplomatic um, assertion of our sovereign rights in the West Philippine Sea together with our allies, something that we cannot accomplish on our own. On the other hand, precisely because globaliz because we, are, we live in a globalized um, uh world, prices of oil and goods and food and utilities have skyrocketed in recent days because of the war in Ukraine and in Russia, rather the war in Ukraine that Russia uh, started. And because Russia uh, is a major exporter of oil, well, yeah. The price of oil, therefore, is increased. And we and what impacts um, countries on the other side of the globe because of globalization impacts us as well. So I think what's important for the Philippines as a third world country, as you mentioned, sir, is to pick our allies well. We must choose our friends well. We choose the ones that uh, uplift us, that respect our rights, so that we would be able to survive in this interconnected planet that we are in. Yes, and of course, you mentioned about the disruption of supply chain and, of course, uh, oil. Um, are there alternative sources of energy available to us then? Uh, can you discuss to me what are some options available? There are plenty of, of um, alternative energy sources. The United Nations, in fact, has identified so both solar and wind energy to be uh, the, the energy of the future. Fossil fuel, a reliance on fossil fuels such as oil and other and coal is de terribly destructive to the planet. 
and therefore uh, being uh, shifting to a, to cleaner energy uh, such as solar and wind is truly the step forward not only for our short-term gain, such as no longer having to buy expensive oil, but also for our long-term survival, because the continued use of fossil fuels allows uh, uh, worsens climate change and the climate crisis. And the good news here is that thanks to advances in technology, solar power, which used to be so expensive, now can be much more... Uh, reasonably purchased. In fact, there is a project in, I believe it's Quezon, uh, because the sunlight is consistently strong there and there is uh, local government support. They're beginning to have solar panels there that would help uh, shift, uh, ease our reliance on fossil fuels. So the future is bright in that sense. Okay, so last question, Philip. Do you think that Filipinos nowadays are more environmentally conscious? <laughs> Definitely, well, precisely because the consequences of not paying attention to the environment are readily and uh, are readily felt. The primary example that comes to mind is Typhoon Odette, which ravaged the Visayas. A uh, scant few months ago, the fields were ravaged, uh, farms were destroyed, homes were abandoned and and totally um, obliterated. And thanks to and the United Nations has identified that severe climate events such as this is on, are only going to become worse and worse as time goes on, and it's very difficult for people not to notice when their homes are flooded, when they have when food is more expensive because farmers can't grow crops because they don't have water to irrigate their fields because the river has dried up because of climate change, when when, when realities, when everyday realities start to shift for the worse, then climate change becomes less abstract and becomes very, very real, very, very quickly. So yes, I think that Filipinos are fast becoming more environmentally conscious now and in the future. Okay, that's it. So thank you very much, Philip. That's the end of our speaking test. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wow. <laughs> Okay, before I ask Sir Marlon to evaluate the performance of Sir Philip, I'd like to ask our live viewers. We have almost 700 live viewers here on Facebook. We'd like to welcome your comments. How did Sir Philip uh, do in the last 14 minutes of speaking uh, in the IELTS. So you may evaluate his performance in terms of fluency, pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar. Now, uh, I'll ask Sir Marlon to do that portion, but as er uh, before we move on to the next part, which is OET speaking, I'm familiar with IELTS, but for OET, I'm not a nurse, so I don't know exactly what's going on. So later, I'll ask Sir Brian to give a short introduction, a short overview of the OET speaking like what I've done earlier because Sir Philip later will play the role of a nurse in the OET speaking role play with Miss Diane, our IELTS head coach, as the patient and Miss Isa is going to evaluate the performance of Sir Philip. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the comments of the attendees, okay. Jessa de Loyola Valiespin, she's actually my chat mate. We frequently exchange messages. She's a midwife in the Middle East, if my memory serves me right. Jessa said, hindi nawawala ng ideas si Sir Philip. Well, that's actually true. FYI, Philip Edward Aitona is CELTA certified. That means to say he has the qualifications to become an IELTS examiner. It's totally up to him if he wants to leave 9.09er right now to work as an IELTS examiner tomorrow. So the quality of Philip's English is not really your uh, fly-by-night English lecturer or someone who just recently graduated from college and was just hired to teach IELTS. So, Meloy Delphine commented, big wow, Bernadette Aguilar, super galing. FYI, we asked the participants to 
suggest topics and questions, and some of them were from the participants, like globalization and renewable sources of energy. I also want you to comment on how Sir Fritz performed as an examiner, because for me, examiners and coaches alike must not be scary. They have to be approachable. They have to be accommodating. And for me, Sir Fritz played a perfect role because he was calm from beginning to end. He did not intimidate the candidate. And I'm just hoping that all examiners, interlocutors, and invigilators in the actual examination would do exactly just that in order for the candidates not to allow nervousness and anxiety to con uh, take control of them. They know for a fact that they are being assessed already. And it doesn't really help if the examiner shows some condescending nuances, okay? So, Sir Marlon, it's your turn. Let's talk about Sir Philip's performance. Let's begin with fluency, followed by pronunciation, and then vocabulary, lastly, grammar. All right. Go ahead. So, good evening, everyone. I hope that you can hear me clearly. So, my name is Lone. I'm one of the senior lecturers here at Niner for the IELTS department, and I'm also the head coach for our TOEFL program. So, I do agree with Sir Philip. You no, know? love comes in different forms. And I do love being here, being with my colleagues. And I love that we can see a lot of people on Facebook right now. And I hope that you're having a good time watching all of us. So, let's talk about Sir Philip's performance. Let's start with fluency and cohesion. The good thing about how he performed, it was really consistent from speaking part one to speaking part two. He really spoke fluently. There were cases where he hesitated, but it was very rare. And on top of that, his hesitation was content related and not grammar or vocabulary related. So to those who are watching us right now, what I'm saying is based not on just my personal experience, but it's based on what we have learned from IELTS examiners. So our coaches and lecturers have received training from IELTS examiners. And on top of that, we have taken the IELTS ourselves. So one thing that we have learned throughout our years of experience when it comes to teaching the IELTS is that examiners tend to be a little bit critical with hesitations that are caused by our inability to construct grammatically correct sentences. But in Sir Philip's case, this was not a problem at all. All his hesitations were content related and they were very, very few. In fact, I could count them with my one hand, all right? So another thing that I would like to discuss when it comes to his fluency is that he used cohesive devices correctly. So for people who are aiming for band seven, you also have to demonstrate this ability. But what separates a band seven from a band nine is that people who are under band seven, they can still use a range of cohesive devices, but there's a tendency to overuse it or underuse it. In Sir Philip's case, it was all appropriately applied to all his answers. Not only that, he was able to fully develop all his answers, supporting it with very significant examples. If we remember his answers about K-pop, he mentioned something about BTS and the ARMY thing. He, but sorry, guys, if I butchered the name of your favorite K-pop group, okay? I don't like K-pop. I'm sorry, you can crucify me all you want, all right? That's my personal take on this matter. <laughs> you can hunt me down at Niner, all right? And then another thing that Sir Philip brought up was the whole examples for alternatives to fossil fuels. So that was really good. And he also went as far as discussing how it affects people when they use these kinds of things. When it comes to his grammatical range and accuracy, one thing that we can really be observant about this is that not only did he commit very few grammatical errors, in fact, I can argue that he did not commit any. He was not satisfied with just simple sentences. So if you're going to answer questions in the IELTS exam, Let's say you used a bunch of simple sentences and you did not commit any mistake. You're probably going to say, hey, I should get a nine. But in reality is the examiner will punish you for that because you're only showcasing a basic knowledge of English grammar. Sure, you did not commit any mistakes, but simple sentences will not do your skills justice. So like Sir Philip, he used complex sentences by using the conjunction because. So he did this in speaking part. He said, I think it's perfectly fine because. And then he introduced the reason behind that which is a perfect example of a complex sentence using the, the subordinating conjunction because. He also used, on the other hand, when he was talking about fiction and non-fictional novels, and then he even threw in some compound sentences using the word end. So for those who don't know, end is a very popular coordinating conjunction that we use to combine two simple sentences in order to come up with compound sentences. This is very technical, and I might sound like I'm blabbing about a lot of jargons, but hey, if you're our student, go watch Sir Fritz grammar classes. I promise you, you will easily understand grammar with Sir Fritz. And then when it comes to lexical resource, Sir Philip uses a lot of English words with full flexibility and precision. 
So the common misconception is, hey, I think I need to use some highfalutin language in order to you know, get some points from the examiner. Not at all. If you notice, Sir Philip did not use a single word that you did not understand. Okay, comment in the comment section if he said one word you did not understand. Because I promise you, I understood everything he said. Although he did use less common lexical items. These are words that we know, but we don't hear a lot from Filipinos. He used words like downtime. He used the word vigilant and communal, which is, again, not something that you would hear from a lot of Filipino test takers. And finally, with his pronunciation, this is something that Sir Urban talks about a lot. When you're in the IELTS speaking test, you have to use the music of English. Sir Philip was not monotonous. And I think it helps that he was smiling throughout the exam, you're not being graded based on facial expression, but the muscles in your face, they will help you produce different sounds. So if you're thinking that, hey, I'm wearing a face mask, maybe the examiner can tell the difference. Not at all. In fact, DJs do this a lot. Even though you cannot see them, they smile while they're talking because it affects the way you sound. And apart from sounding really good, Sir Philip did not commit any pronunciation errors. In the Philippines, we tend to struggle with the P and F sound, the B and D sounds, these consonant sounds that were not originally part of the Filipino alphabet. And to that, Sir Philip did not even commit one single mistake. And I guess the biggest factor to consider, we did not have any problem understanding Sir Philip. A band nine speaker, in terms of pronunciation, you won't exert any effort to understand this person. So across the board, it's a band nine. This is what a band nine sounds like. And if I'm talking too fast, it's just because I'm so excited to hear all of these people again. I haven't seen my co-lecturers for a long time, even my boss, Sir Urban. So please forgive me if I'm talking too fast. So it's just excitement, okay? Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Before we go to the OED portion, here's a comment from Mona Lisa Ko Bayo. Sir, do examiners ask questions related to war? Well, as I usually inform my students in class, in IELTS, it's anything everything under the sun. If the examiner wants to talk about the body of water, move on to the importance of trees and the next question related to billboard and then moving on to historical site, it's totally up to the examiner. What you're supposed to do as an IELTS candidate is to open your mouth. That is why do not register for the test unless you are prepared. If I may borrow something that I learned from Sir Philip two years ago during our YouTube shoot, you cannot give what you do not have, which means to say, you cannot say something if you're totally unfamiliar with it. So what do you do? You feed your mind first. Expose yourself to as many questions as you can. Fortunately, the 9.09 or IELTS dashboard contains more than 2,000 actual topics and questions which are frequently recycled. So this is the good news. If you encounter something beforehand, you get to be prepared when you hear it yourself in the actual examination. So you do not panic anymore. At the back of your mind, you're telling yourself, okay, this is something that I've encountered beforehand. All I have to do now is just to open my mouth. That's why... We don't just teach the basics, the fundamentals of English, but at the same time, we feed you with the usual questions and help you in generating ideas. Don't think that Niner is pro spoon feeding. We want you to generate ideas first, and then we'll tell you how we can improve it for the better. And then Hershey here commented, sir, you must be so proud of the people you are with. And of course, because we, we don't just hire anyone. If you've noticed, the people here, like the nine lecturers and coaches here, I'm sure you were able to see their credentials. Why do we share that one? That is to give you an idea that when you entrust your 4,000 pesos and that's valid for life, quality review does not need to be expensive. And it's not as if we're born with this kind of mouth. It's not as if we started talking like this since yesterday. It was an uphill climb for us. It was a tall order. We had to work our way up knowing that all of us here are Filipinos not with English as our second language or third language. Now, if I may add to what Sir Marlon said, fluency, Sir Philip did not sound scripted at all. How would you know? There were times he had short pauses. Does it mean that you're going to fail if you have short pauses? No, it only means to say that you're still thinking of what you're going to say. At the end of the day, IELTS examiners are not dumb. They would know if something is scripted or memorized. Now, for fluency, I want to add that the quality of answers of Sir Philip is not something that you get to encounter every single day, especially for task two, something that you're fond of 
uh, listening, something that you want to listen to. Well, he doesn't like other types of music because it's relatively noisy, but what he wants to listen to is silence. It's something that you don't get to hear every week or even every month. You think of something that will capture the interest, the imagination of the examiner. Pronunciation-wise, Sir Philip is not actually uh, theatrical. Notice that when he talks, he's just calm. He's just very conversational. But he sounds confident. Remember, you cannot convince the examiner that you deserve seven or nine if in the first place you are not happy with how you deliver. It starts from within. You invite the people around you. Hey, I deserve to get a seven. I deserve to get nine. Listen to me. I, I am here to get your attention and I'll hold it down the line until the very end. Lexical resource. Sir Philip did not use complicated language. Although there are certain words like obliterated, which we do not get to hear every day, Sir Philip used these words correctly. For grammatical range and accuracy, he did not settle for short, choppy sentences. He used correct English, and the moment he recognized, okay, uh, there's this grammatical slip, he corrected himself right away. And that's extra points for you in the actual examination because you're giving the examiner an idea. Hey, examiner, I actually know what's right. It's just that this is speaking. There is no time to think. You just have to open your mouth. So here I am. I'm a human being. I commit mistakes. So I'm correcting myself right now because it means to say I know what is grammatically correct. So Philip Edward Aitana, perfect nine in speaking, perfect A in OET speaking version one, perfect A in OET speaking version 2.0. Now we move on to OET speaking. But before that, if Sir Fritz and Sir Marlon would like to go because uh, they don't have participation in the next few minutes, may I just ask Sir Fritz and Sir Marlon to name their two lucky winners. So Sir Fritz, first I need you to tell me the winner of Buy One Cake 60 Abroad Starter Pack. Who's your winner? All right, so let me just go through the chat messages and look for the one who is most active. So. Yeah, so I, I've actually been seeing the name Janina. Yes, I'm not really sure how uh, if it's if it's her full name, but uh, her profile name there says Janina. So like three different syllables there. Ah, okay, so there. So R N Lyris Alangilan Erolf. Yes, I think so that's your... uh, that's her name. Right. So there. So Janina. So she's your buy one take 60 abroad starter pack only for yeah. life winner. Okay, yes, congratulations, correct. Janina. Message me later because I'm going to ask for your complete name, email address. Because if you're already enrolled, automatically we will upgrade your package to buy one take 60 abroad starter pack only for life. If you are not enrolled, then we're going to ask you to fill out the registration form and then the processing team is going to process it. Congratulations. What about your uh, book winner. Well, the winner gets to choose from any of the okay. five. OET, speaking, uh, OET writing, IELTS speaking, IELTS writing, um, OET speaking, and our eight-in-one book. So now we have five books on Shopee. Grammar book is coming out next week. So when we speak of grammar, it's not just for IELTS candidates, but it's also for your kids, elementary, high school, college, or any professional who just wants a refresher course because you must not allow wrong grammar to get in the way of your future. So, Sir Fritz, who's your uh, lucky winner for the book? All right, so I've selected Diana Soriano. Diana Soriano, so that's Diana Soriano. Yeah. Please, please message me book. later. I'll be asking for your right. complete complete name, delivery details, complete Philippine address, and mobile number. So thank you, Sir Fritz, for joining us tonight. You may have your dinner now. What All about right, Sir you. Marlon? Sir Marlon, you're two lucky winners, please. All right. So I think for the book, sir, am I right? So we have one for the book and then one for the abroad starter pack. Am I correct, sir? That is correct. All right. So for the book, we have Miss... Mona Lisa Ko Bio or Bio? I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Mona Lisa Ko Bio. I think that's how you pronounce her name. I'm going to send the 
Facebook link to you, sir. So in case we need to get in touch with her. All right. So well, this, she's she's actually one of my possible winners because she's oh, very really? participative yeah. since 6 p.m. So okay. I, I definitely remember the, the name. My yeah. memory is Elephantine. <laughs> my memory you want me to pick another right winner, sir? Do you want me to yeah, pick the another winner? Yeah, the other winner. winner. So uh, Mona Lisa is the winner of the free book, right? Yeah, winner of the free book. And then for okay, our... What about the buy one, take 60 abroad starter pack? Who's your so, winner? So for the abroad starter pack, I have Miss Christine... Christine K. Hesita. Christine K. Hesita, congratulations. Yes. Buy yes. one, take 60, abroad yes. starter pack. Sir Lone, thank you for your time. Thank Enjoy you your and dinner. You. Bye-bye, guys. Don't worry because we still have Sir Philip, Sir Brian, Miss Ben, Miss Diane, Miss Isa, Miss Anne. They're going to pick two winners each, plus myself. Seven times two. 14 more winners in the next few minutes. And now we have almost 750 live viewers on Zoom. Well, I asked Sir Brian to discuss OET speaking in general. I need the healthcare professionals to suggest topics. So Ms. Diane is going to be our patient later on. What could possibly be the sickness or the ailment of uh, Miss Diane. And think of these topics or um, health conditions and please comment on the chat box, okay? Sir Brian, OET speaking overview, please. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our all-stars session here on FB Live. <laughs> And thank you so much for joining. Please keep tagging your friends so that you'll have a chance of winning any one of our books or our review packages here at 9.09 or IELTS Review and Tutorial Center. Now for OET, let's talk about the occupational English test. You would know that this examination is intended for healthcare professionals. So for doctors or nurses or physiotherapists or occupational therapists, et cetera, they can take OET as an alternative to another English examination that's popular, which is IELTS, particularly when they're headed to certain countries like Ireland, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, or New Zealand. It's totally different from IELTS in that the test is going to be a role play. So what you're going to get is a couple of role plays and uh, not an interview. Well, there's an interview portion before you start with the role plays, and that's called your warm-up conversation in which an interlocutor will be asking you questions about your profession. It's just an overall uh, assessment of your professional background. This part, which is the warm-up conversation, is not going to be graded, but after your three minutes uh, warm-up conversation, uh, you're, you're going to straight away jump into the five-minute role plays. So each of the role plays will have uh, preparation time. So you'll be given around three minutes or two to three minutes to prepare what you're going to say. You will be provided a piece of paper which is going to contain your role play and it's going to contain the setting as well as the situation or the condition of the patient. And uh, you're also going to get there the uh, bullet uh, instructions, what you need to comply with in your OET. You will be given some time to prepare what you're going to say. You can ask questions to the interlocutor if you want to during this preparation time. And then after that, you will have to speak with your interlocutor in a very interactive fashion for a total of five minutes. That's for role play one. Then after that, uh, everything is going to be collected. You're going to be given another set of role play cards and you will have to do the second role play. It is very important to note that the interlocutor that you're talking to is not the one who's going to grade you, unlike in IELTS in which the examiner, the one that you're communicating with, is the one who's going to give you a score. In OET, the entire conversation is going to be recorded and your examiner is going to come from Melbourne, Australia, who is going to assess your performance. And by the way, it's not just one examiner who's going to assess your performance, unlike in IELTS in which your fate lies in the hands of just one person. There are going to be a couple of assessors or qualified examiners who are going to review your performance for the speaking examination and uh, the average of the scores that you're going to get from the two different examiners, depending on their profile, will be the grade that will be awarded for you in the test. Unlike in IELTS in which you're going to be graded from a scale of 1.0 to 9.0 or actually zero if you don't attend your examination, 
you're going to be graded in letter scores or numerical scores ranging from zero to 500 or A to E. In most instances, at least for all of the countries that I've mentioned a while ago, your target is to get a B or 350 and over in the OET. So that's a very brief discussion about your occupational English test uh, speaking examination. Thank you so much, Sir Brian. So I'm reading the comments. Some healthcare professionals suggested Alzheimer's, aneurysm, uh, COVID, what else? Dementia, and stage renal disease. What else do we have here? Right upper quadrant pain, lower quadrant pain, cancer, uh, pediatric, how to deal with difficult patients. So why did we choose Ms. Diane as our patient? Because Ms. Diane is not a healthcare professional. She's actually our IELTS head coach. In the actual examination, OET interlocutors are not necessarily in the medical field. Okay, so Ms. Diane right here is the perfect example of a patient who could possibly be someone that our healthcare professionals are going to take care of in the hospital setting. So I assume it's Ms. Diane who's going to mention the topic, right? Is it Ms. Diane? Right, yeah. because Ms. Diane is the in interlocutor. So Sir Philip is going to make sure the therapeutic communication is uh, present from beginning to end of the OED speaking role play. IELTS speaking is much longer because it lasts for up to 14 minutes, but this time it's much shorter. So Ms. Diane, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So Sir Irvin has already mentioned that I'm not a healthcare professional. Uh, I'm going to try my best to act like a patient. So okay, so let's begin. Okay, so hello, Sir Philip. Um, today I'm going to play the role of your patient, and you are going to be the healthcare professional. You are going to have three minutes to prepare, and then after three minutes, you will have five minutes to facilitate the discussion. I'm going to share my screen and then um, show you the topic for tonight. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. Okay, hold on. Share screen. Um, here it is. I hope everyone can see it. Sir Philip, can you see my screen? No. I can see your role play card. I would need to see mine because the one projected is for the patient, I believe. Ah, uh, hold on, sir. No worries. no worries. This is for you, I believe. Okay, let me stop sharing. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, for Sir Philip's role play card. Okay, give me a second, Sir Philip. No worries. No worries. Um, so patients are most of the time not ready. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for the um Miss Isa. Can I can you help, send it to Sir. Can you help me? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> you can do. It. We believe in you, Miss Dea. Okay, so Miss Isa is going to share Sir Philip's uh card role play card. Should I um read it for uh Miss Isa? Mm -hmm. Can you please share on screen? Oh, uh, hang on, I'll try. So while they're busy in looking for ways on how to possibly show our live viewers the role play card, in the actual OET, there is a different role play card for the examinee and a different role play card for the interlocutor. That's why Sir Philip earlier mentioned, uh, Miss Diane, what you are showing me is supposed to be your role play card, not my role play card. Okay? So the others who are joining us now, what role play is Sir Irvin talking about? That's how it is in OET speaking. If IELTS speaking is about a conversation of any topic in OET, the role of the, uh, the OET candidate is 
the specific profession he or she is in. Say, for instance, you are uh, a dentist, uh, a podiatrist, a physician. So in this case, because Sir Philip is a registered nurse, and in the actual examination, more than 75% of the OET candidates worldwide are nurses. So Sir Philip, for tonight, is going to play the role of a nurse. So... Sir, let me share my um, role play card while Miss Isa is um, looking for Sir Philip's role play card. So this go mine, ahead. This mine. Um, okay. So this is a the scenario. It says you are. Uh, can you see my screen, po? On, yeah, we can. Yes. In order to okay. make it more realistic, I will be. Closing my eyes and not listening. <laughs> okay. So this is my card. It says the setting is a community health clinic and the patient is 35 years old and works as a computer engineer. So that's me. Your office is 10 minutes away from home and your evenings are spent either in front of the TV or in the local pub with friends. You usually miss breakfast because of being too busy and tend to eat snacks or fast food during the day. Recently, you have noticed a marked decrease in your energy levels, particularly in the afternoons. You lead a busy life and do not get any exercise or physical activity. You do not have any significant health problems, but lately you have been getting breathless while playing with your nephew on weekends. So my task is to ask why it is important to lose weight and respond to Sir Philip's questions. I will express concern that it will be hard to make changes to my lifestyle. And finally, I'll be reluctant to agree to comply with the advice and return in a month's time for a review. So that's my role play card um, as a patient. Okay, so let me stop sharing. Okay, Sir um, Philip's role play card is uh, from Miss Isa. Let's wait for Miss Isa to share her screen in order for our live viewers to read or to be aware of the role play card that's going to be assigned to Sir Philip, the OET examining. Ms. Isa? Um, see, Ms. N, uh, she will be the one to share the, um, the role play card. Unfortunately, okay. I'm using my phone, sir, and my all my records are on my PC. So, But I have forwarded, forwarded it already. Thank you very much. I suppose just like Ms. Dayan read her role play card, I should read mine as well. The setting is the Community Health Center. Um, I'm a nurse. You are talking to a 35-year-old computer engineer who has been referred by her doctor for advice on weight loss. The patient has been experiencing breathlessness and exertion and has been advised by her GP to lose weight to improve her health status. The patient is overweight and has a BMI of 25. The first task, discuss the importance of losing weight. Breathlessness may be caused by overweight. Ask questions about the patient's general lifestyle, including drinking and eating habits. Provide advice on increasing physical activity and eating a suitable diet, such as reducing alcohol intake, eating fruits and vegetables. And finally, advise the patient to come back for a review in four weeks' time. In the actual test, I, now that I've been given my role play card, I have a certain amount of time to read it. Isn't that correct, Ms. Diane? Yes, we have three minutes to prepare for this. Then after three minutes, we are going to talk about this for five minutes. So um, let me start the timer, Sir Philip. Um, please begin. So while Sir Philip is preparing, maybe we can ask Ms. Anne to share some tips on how to prepare or maximize the three minutes that's being given to the candidate. What are the top things that you're supposed to do while you are preparing for the five-minute role play? Miss Anne? Thank you very much for that one, Sir Philip. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to all our viewers. This is um, Coach Anne. I'd like to share to you three good tips during your three-minute prep time. Number one, Ask questions. If there's any word and you're not so sure about its meaning, it's good to ask clarification regarding the meaning from your interlocutor. So for example, if 
if there's a word there that says, um, interlocutor, I don't quite understand the word suitable. <laughs> For example, you don't quite, you're not quite sure about the definition of a word. You can ask clarification about this one from your interlocutor. Um, you can also ask how a word is pronounced. So, for example, if you don't know how, let's say, um, interlocutor, how do you pronounce this word? And then you point it out. You can ask clarification for that one because for, um, intelligibility is one of our criteria. Second top tip would be, I, I think it's good to prepare your opening skill. So when you're oh, when you begin with a good start, everything follows. Pag magandang umpisa, maganda lahat. So prepare your opening spiel. There's a very specific technique we teach our students regarding this. It's an acronym. You don't write your script. You just write keywords, for example. For example, bullets. That would give you a guide when you need to speak more slowly. You write it on your role play card. Or you can... Um, oh yeah, that's it. So thirdly, I think during the three-minute prep time, it's good to underline your tasks. Um, you underline the verb you have per task. So if it says discuss, you underline that one. You underline ask, you underline provide advice. Okay, you underline the verbs you have per task and then you also underline the adjectives as to how your patient was described. So I think those are my three top tips during the three-minute prep time. Sir Irvin, thank you. Miss Anne, I'd like to entice our live viewers to look forward to your OET gold label book. By the way, hello to our OET examinees worldwide. Miss Anne is almost finished with her four-in-one OET book. What makes it four-in-one? It includes OET listening, OET reading, OET grammar, and OET vocabulary. Her deadline is supposed to be on March 31, but I'd like to ask her now. From 1% to 100%, uh, how's your completion or how's your progress so far? Well, I'm caught off guard by that question, Sir Irvin. So I I think I, I'm currently finalizing. So I'm done pretty much with everything. Oh, I'm I think I'm on the part where I, I'm thinking about adding something, revising something, or maybe improving something. So I'm at that part. So with regard to the personage of how complete my book is, <laughs> I think 70 or 70 80. to 80 percent. Yeah. He's a long Hello, time. So, sorry, Sir Irvin. May I three minutes interrupt? Yes. Po. So okay, that's the end of three minutes. So this time we have five minutes to do the role play. Sir Philip, um, our time starts now. Good afternoon, ma'am. Miss Diane, um, it's good to see. Uh, it's good that you're here at our community center. It says here in your records that you have been referred by your doctor here for getting some advice on weight loss because you have been having difficulty breathing when you are active. Is this accurate? Did I get that right? Uh, yes, you did. Actually, my problem is that um, I, I'm, I'm usually out of breath. Um, when I want to do something physical, for example, I want to play with my nephew, I tend to feel really exhausted. Um, so this is my major or my chief complaint. So I would like to know how I should um, manage this uh, with, of course, your help. I'm sorry to hear that you've been having some trouble with uh, spending time with your loved ones because of what you're feeling right now. And I'm glad that you came here because this would allow you to manage it uh, much better. It, it's good that you're here because in order to address your breathlessness, your being out of breath, it's a good idea for you to lose some weight because the, the amount of weight that you currently have is a little above normal. And if we get that weight uh, closer to what is average, then this would significantly make your breathing much easier. And in order for us to do this, it would be important for us to understand exactly what, how you're living your life right now so that we could identify interventions or rather strategies that would um, allow us to accomplish this goal of losing weight much better. 
would it be okay for me to ask you a few questions regarding your general lifestyle? Okay, sure, you can ask any question. I am glad to hear that. When it comes to drinking, first of all, how frequently would you say you drink alcohol? Well, to be honest, this is a way for me to relieve stress. So I kind of drink with friends um, a few times in a week. And perhaps I don't see any reason why I should stop drinking because I see that this fits my lifestyle. And yeah, I feel um, less stressed out when I drink with friends. I, uh, using alcohol as a way to bond and socialize with others is indeed a very common way of relieving stress. And you are correct that ultimately the decision is yours whether you choose to continue drinking or you choose to address the breathlessness that you are feeling, which you said also in, makes it harder for you to spend time with your loved ones. Yeah, at the end of the day, um, the, our goal here is to present you with options so that you could make the best decision that uh, you feel is good, is best for you. Um, uh, moving forward, uh, when it comes to your eating habits, how would you describe your diet? Well, um, it's actually very um, typical. Uh, many people nowadays eat instant food or anything microwavable, microwavable. And that is what I do because I have a, a hectic schedule. And perhaps this is my way of coping with, yeah, I said stress a while ago. That's my very big problem. And so I see that it's very convenient for me. So should I change that habit? I mean, I think it would be more stressful if I shift from my... Um, habit my old habits and then i'm going to adapt a new habit i don't really find it necessary is that necessary i'm glad that you're asking because this shows that you are open to to understanding things in a different way you are totally correct ma'am that it would cause some difficulty in changing the way that you do things any change um, is whether for the good or for the bad is never easy because it entails um, getting out of your comfort zone and uh, trying something new that you it's understandable that you resort to um, eating fast food for convenience and because you're stressed and just like with your alcohol consumption mom, it the choice ultimately is yours because any decision that you make has trade-offs if you continue to consume alcohol and eat the food that you've been eating, you, you remain comfortable. At the same time, though, unfortunately, this would not allow us to take steps towards reducing your weight, which means that, unfortunately, you would continue to run out of breath when you become more active. So I suppose the question right now is, would you be willing to consider ways to minimize your alcohol consumption and perhaps eat in a better way? Or would you prefer to perhaps keep things the way they are? Maybe I can adjust, but uh, I would like some time um, to at least um, ch manage the change. Uh, I don't want to be doing this abruptly because I think that it will affect my concentration, especially at work. I don't want to get um, confused with uh, what to eat or what not to eat. So with your help, uh, perhaps you can give me some suggestions on how I can um, manage this, um, perhaps gradually. I believe five minutes has, have been... Okay, time's up. Sorry, yeah. sir. I got <laughs> carried away. So <laughs> that, that was actually six <laughs> minutes. Ah, Sorry about sure. that. No okay. Sure. So... Um, Okay, should we move to the next task card, sir? Or oh, there's move another. On to the evaluation from yes. Ms. Isa. Hello, Let's sir. Let's hear from Ms. Isa. Yes. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hey, uh, good evening. So, for tonight's feedback regarding the performance of our, of course, inter uh, our interlocutor first at the end. <laughs> You gave, uh, 
you, in a way, the, the way that uh, Ms. Diane handled the conversation, this is actually what will happen in the exam because the interlocutor or your patient will have his or her own role play card. So whatever it is that Ms. Diane is saying as Sir Philip's um, patient, it's actually in line with the card that Sir Philip has. So it's it's not uh, something that will be out just out of the blue. Regarding uh, the transitioning of the topics, if you would notice, actual exam as well. Okay, um, there are bullets in the role play card that will be followed, but. I need everyone to remember that it's not always going to be in that order all the time. Okay, that depends on how the conversation goes. And there isn't really a specific format that everyone should follow. Now, with, of course, Sir Philip, I don't think I am in the position <laughs> to give him feedback. I don't think that I'm even qualified to. But, <laughs> Sir Fee, please, uh, I'm going to borrow Sir Marlon's uh, vocab. Please don't crucify me after this. I love, love, Sir Fee. Um, regarding Sir Philip's uh, linguistic uh, performance first, I mean, his uh, skills when it comes to the first criteria in the OED speaking, which is composed of intelligibility, fluency, appropriateness of language, and resources of grammar and expression. I don't think that there was actually uh, a problem with his performance. That's the reason why he got two A's. So if you were paying attention to how he spoke, that's proof of his skill. And regarding intelligibility, no word was mispronounced. In fact, the words that he used were very basic, not at all something that uh, a typical person would understand. Uh, there was also enough intonation to convince the patient to share. Okay? He did not sound monotonous, like he's not, he did not sound like he doesn't want what he's doing. Most of the people I talk to whenever I do coaching, I would notice that they sound like they're doing the speaking exam or the coaching just because they have to. So they ask questions without the, the right intonation. And then it doesn't feel like the, pa the, the nurse is even interested to talk to the patient. With Sir Philip, he used the right intonation consistently. So no problem with that. Uh, regarding fluency, Surfi, um, no comment. You were so good in controlling your speed. One transition, uh, one to well, a transition from one topic to another was seamless. It was very smooth. There was enough acknowledgement that would guide the the patient that you're shifting to a different topic. So fluency. Very smooth, sir. And you did not speak very fast, which is what we want with other with our students. Um, I've heard students who would actually stutter a lot, or sometimes they would tend to speak very fast because they fear that the idea might disappear. But then again, uh, the right speed is always the key. Um, regarding language, first of uh, appropriateness of language, first of all, uh, Sir, uh, the way that Sir Fee conducted the, the the conversation was very professional. Uh, even though there were instances that uh, the uh, that they that the patient uh, gave information, like she, uh, the patient said that um, there's nothing wrong. I, she doesn't see anything wrong with her lifestyle, like the drinking, the way that uh, Sir Philip handled those with the right acknowledgement, right uh, tone, there was nothing wrong with that. And no inaccurate words were used in the, 
entire conversation. Resources of grammar and expression would talk about how the test taker uh, handles the grammatic or how the test taker organizes the, the words used in a sentence. So grammatical accuracy is being tested here and also vocabulary choices. Um, even though the topic was actually very simple, we did not hear a lot of medical jargons, the right vocabulary or the right word choices for the patient to understand the situation was used. Now, regarding the flow of the conversation, you would notice that uh, Sir Philip started a conversation by already acknowledging Miss Diane's name, by saying it's good that you're here, uh, Diane. Now, a lot of people tend to start with or, or tend to start the conversation by asking, what's your name? May I have your name? Okay, so this could be a technique but then again, you, sh you need to show that you have a strong opening or a strong way to start the conversation. You have to have rapport with your patient. So for me, the way that uh, the conversation was started was very strong. And there was there this um, uh, part where Sir Philip asked, so um, you're having difficulty of breathing? Is this accurate? Now with that, um, that's one way of incorporating the patient's perspective and validating it as well, because that means um, the information is there and what we want is to gather the right information as well from the patient. And in the, in the speaking exam, um, you're not just gonna be assessed based on whether you know the topic or the diagnosis, okay, you're going to be checked based on how you ask questions, how you acknowledge what the patient is saying. So there, there's this line, I'm glad you came here, which is something that a lot of people use, but sometimes out of, I mean, they use it in the wrong context. So when you say, I'm glad that you came here, um, please make sure that your tone also says it because <laughs> some, some students would not, would deliver it like just monotonous, in a monotonous manner. And Sir Philip also was able to use the right words when he said, um, that the patient's weight is a little above normal, which is definitely how we want to also use the right, um, how, that's how we want to deliver without also offending our patient. Because if you just say, you know, you look um, overweight, definitely that would not be very helpful. And after, the right after rapport, after establishing or after gathering information, it was followed by assessment. And you would notice that there is or there was uh, the right transitioning from one topic to another. Would it be okay if I ask further questions? And then there was a clear structure all throughout the, the conversation. Um, the thought, the flow of the thought were organized. Uh, whenever a new topic is being introduced, like Sir Philip would say, moving forward, okay, we're transitioning to a different topic, which means that uh, the patient will not get lost. And the patient would know what to expect. And uh, acknowledgement is the key. There were lines like, I'm glad you're asking. And there's this uh, validation of what the patient said. Uh, the choice is ultimately yours. It, we're not forcing the patient to, or we're not demanding the patient to follow what we were saying, but instead um, the lines were very much, very, uh, were very much um, enough to give the patient options as well. And at the end of it, there's this line when Sir P said, at the same time though, this wouldn't allow us to 
address your breathlessness. So in a way that is um, helping the patient understand that, okay, my lifestyle isn't that right, so I have to do something about it. With that, we're giving information that is uh, not going to be offensive for the patient. And in the OAT speaking, we have information gathering. So you'll be checked based on how you also listen to the responses of the patient. And by knowing what to say afterwards, um, you also need to verify patient understanding in a way that uh, it would not be um, too confusing as well for the patient. So overall, uh, the the I don't think that I'm... <laughs> I mean, the position to say, to, to give it like an accurate score, but of course, your fee, uh, the performance for me is something that I, way above the usual that I hear when I do coaching. In fact, uh, I have no doubts why you got an A in your exam. So thank you. Guys, I hope you were <laughs> listening to Surfy because that's everything we want in the speaking exam. Okay, you might be wondering why it took Ms. Isa quite a while to talk about the performance of a Sir Philip. Well, that's because in IELTS, there's just four criteria. But in OET, Sir Brian, how many criteria do we have all in all for speaking? Well, um, sir, we have uh, a total of four different uh, communicative criteria for linguistics. And then for uh, the, there are plenty actually for the uh, clinical communication criteria. And uh, yeah, um, there, there's just a lot to assess for OET in comparison with IELTS. So um, IELTS has just four, but these four will just be the first one, which is the clinical communication criteria. There's still the, uh, uh, sorry, the linguistic criteria, and there's still the clinical communication criteria, which needs to, uh, which need to also be met by the candidate. There you go. So... Now let's ask Miss Diane and Miss Isa to identify four lucky winners. Two coming from Miss Diane, two coming from Miss Isa. One for the free book and another one by One Take 60 Abroad Starter Pack. Right after this one, we move on to the on the spot writing of Sir Brian, both IELTS and OET. So let's begin with Miss Diane. Your two winners, please. Hi, sir. So we have a lot here. There is a list of names. And then I got I got two. I'm not sure why I chose them, but first is Chu Wichoko. <laughs> the name is Chu Wichoko. And then the other one. Um, so this, uh, what does Chu Wichoko get? Uh, the book or the uh, abroad starter pack? And the the abroad starter uh, pack, sir. Congrats, Shui Choko. Thank you for tagging your friends to join our Facebook Live session. What about the free book? And then for the free book, again, this is based on my conscience. The name is Anna Lu Aradaza. So I didn't, um, I just, no, I just um, randomly picked the name. So the name is Anna Lu Aradaza. So she wins the free book. And she gets to pick which book she'd like to have. We're going to send it to her via LBC to any Philippine address. Free book and free shipping. Thank you for your time, Miss Diane. What about Miss you, Isa? Your two lucky winners, Miss Isa. Uh, for the eight in one book, I have Candida Cruz. Mm -hmm. And for the package, Dexter Manzanillo RN. Congratulations. So I need you guys to take note of those names because later when they message me, I want to double check with you. Is this person one of the winners really? Okay. So now let's move on to the writing portion. Obviously, we start with IELTS, but I don't want Sir Philip to leave us just yet because Sir Philip will be my partner in talking about IELTS writing and OET writing. Well, Sir Brian will do the on-the-spot writing. Miss Den. 
our assistant head coach for IELTS will evaluate the performance of Sir Brian in IELTS. Whereas Miss Anne, our assistant head coach for our OET department, is going to give feedback on Sir Brian's OET output. So, Sir Philip, let's talk about IELTS writing. Hurrah! IELTS writing is different for people taking general training on one hand and the academic version on the other. You see, in the IELTS exam, there are two tasks that must be accomplished, uh, writing task one and writing task two. And these tasks uh, have to be accomplished in one hour. If there's one thing that you remember about writing tasks is that, that the most common reason for failure is running out of time. Uh, that's why we cannot emphasize enough that when you practice doing these writing tasks, whether on your own or together with us at Niner, is that you do these tasks um, in the allotted time, just like in the actual exam. Writing task one for academic is a report where you're given either numerical or graphical data and you're expected to make sense of it. On the other hand, if you're taking general training, you have to write a letter either um, a formal or an informal one, given the prompts to you. For everyone, though, whether you're taking general training or academic, your writing task two is an essay. You are asked to write an argumentative essay where you express your opinions regarding the topic that's given to you. There, it's, there are four criteria that examiners use in order to know what grade to give you in IELTS writing. The first is task achievement for writing task one or task response for writing task two, uh, coherence and cohesion, grammatical range and accuracy, as well as lexical resource. Lexis means words, resource means at your disposal. So lexical resource means the words at your disposal, otherwise vocabulary. These four criteria are, are of equal weight, 25% um, each. What this means is that it does not mean that if you are not so good at what criteria that you necessarily fail, but rather what this means is you could compensate for whatever errors you commit in one criteria with your performance in the others. It's a holistic assessment. Obviously, there are two tasks in IELTS writing, but we don't have plenty of time to do both. So what Sir Brian is going to do is task two, so that it's exactly the same for academic and general training candidates. So may I ask our live viewers, which topic would you like Sir Brian to use as his task description for his on-the-spot IELTS writing task two? Now, let's take a look at the comments of our attendees. Maybe some of you would like Sir Brian to write about education or perhaps a task description that has something to do with technology. Or one of the most common, the one that comes out every month, it could be people and society. Mm -hmm. There are topics that also come out like every other month or once every three months like environment or politics or economics. But some of you, are already aware that those are the most common topics. That's why I'm thinking perhaps you might want to ask questions or mention topics that you're not very familiar with and you might want you might want Sir Brian to help you out in generating ideas such that if you encounter that topic or question in the actual examination, you have the arsenal, the weaponry that will help you not just pass, but also ace the examination. Let's take a look at the suggested topics. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christine K. Hesita, war. What about the suggestion of Nancy Ching Calderon, consumerism? Adrian Legaspi suggested government ban for nurses. Okay, Raymond Apolentissima recommended environmental issues. Mona Lisa Cobayo is thinking, hmm, what about climate change? Marie Lin suggests vaccination. Amis RMC, why not talk about people in general? Candida Cruz, noise. Now, I have with me more than 200 task descriptions. And so, earlier, I told myself, okay, I'm going to pick a random question from 1 to 200. Today is March 20, 
five. Okay? Now, I'm thinking, why not topic number 25? Now, looking at my list, what's number 25? Okay, for the benefit of our live viewers, I'm going to share it here on the chat box. Okay, Sir Brian, I'll read it for you. More and more people are shopping online these days than ever before. Question number one, why do people prefer to shop this way? Question number two, are there any disadvantages to online shopping? So in the actual examination, it's totally up to you whether you like to start with task one or with task two. But Niner recommends that you begin with task two because the value of this is 66% of your grade. Sir Philip already gave you an idea of the four criteria that IELTS writing examiners use in evaluating your performance. Sir Brian, the floor is yours and Miss Ben will give her feedback later. Take it away, Sir Brian. Hi guys, uh, thank you so much for sticking around till this section of your discussion for this uh, All Stars FB Live. And again, uh, let me re remind everyone to tag your friends, at least five of them, so that they'll have a chance, uh, you'll have a chance of winning our free book or free unlimited review package. Um, the question is actually a combination of some of the things that you wrote on uh, Facebook as comments. Some wrote about consumerism and then others were talking about online versus traditional um, uh, schooling. So this is like a mix of online shopping. Uh, I would need your participation, okay? So you will have to join me. I will be asking you a few questions as we sail along and uh, write this essay uh, on the spot today. Okay, right. So um, yeah, I'm looking at the Facebook uh, live feed. So um, I'm going to start sharing my screen just a moment. I will be presenting the question and uh, I hope I got that right. So... Uh, the question that I typed is, more and more people are shopping online these days than ever before. Why do people prefer to shop this way? Are there any disadvantages to online shopping? Okay, so what we teach here in IELTS is for open-ended questions, you have to respond by providing an answer to all of the questions that are asked individually in separate paragraphs. So in this case, we write an introduction. We answer the first question, which is about the uh, reasons, okay, why people prefer to shop this way. And we're also going to answer the second question, which uh, is about the disadvantages to online shopping. Okay, so there are a couple of questions here. What we usually do in class is we uh, prepare an outline. So uh, perhaps uh, you can help me out with my outline right here. I usually uh, create a table <laughs> and then I put here the arguments. Okay, the reasons, okay, examples, and I also answer the question, so what? Let me just make this a little smaller so that, you know, it would fit. Okay, right, so can you tell me, guys, what are the possible reasons why people shop online? What are the advantages, perhaps, or what are the benefits of shopping online? Can you give me a couple of reasons? All right, so let's start with the reasons before we jump right into our uh, disadvantages, okay? Reasons, guys. Can you post your reasons on Facebook? All right, okay. It's more convenient, yes. Yes, it's more convenient. That's one of the advantages or one of the reasons that people like to shop online. What else? For safety, yes, I would agree because uh, we are in a pandemic situation, all right? But apart from that, let's look at some other um, suggestions. What else? Apart from it's convenient, it, it, it consumes much less time, there's much less hassle, they're all under the umbrella of convenient, right? Uh, how about the, the items that you can buy online? Can you describe to me the items that you can buy online? Okay, right. Uh-huh. They are delivered right to your doorstep. That's still convenient. You could choose from several shops. Okay, so I will accept that. 
Thank you, Emily, for that suggestion. Uh, probably what we are pointing out here is that uh, there is a wide variety of choices or options okay, when you shop online. But um, yeah, I'm going to elaborate this later. Can you give me some of disadvantages, possible risks of shopping online? Okay, can you give me some disadvantages to shopping online? Right? Yes, there are, there's a variety of choices. So I'm going to use the words that you're giving me. Uh, okay, so let's use choices. All right, so um, yeah, any disadvantages? Yeah, you receive the wrong size, okay? You're not satisfied. You're, you're not um, happy with the quality of the items that you receive. Um, or they don't fit, okay? Particularly with items of clothing, all right? So yeah, so there's absolutely no way for you to check the quality of the products that you're buying, all right? Unable, unable to check the quality of the products that you, you are purchasing. Some of them might be damaged. There, there's no warranty. But more importantly, what else could be a possible disadvantage of, sh of uh, shopping online? Yeah, all right. So um, yeah, if you receive delayed delivery, that's not that much of an issue, I guess. Right, uh, delayed gratification because of the delivery instead of going to the mall. Okay, I might consider, but let me look at some other uh, suggestions on what hacking, like what is going to be hacked. All right, oh, your account. Okay, some might have misleading advertisements. Don't you think these are all scams? Uh, so I think we can say that it might be uh, you know, uh, unsafe for some people, okay? In so far as there might be online scams, right? Or um, there might be a chance that your credit card details might be hacked, as one of your friends mentioned a while ago. Okay, so that's enough. Usually, you don't really need a lot of reasons. Just a couple of reasons per side will do. And then you just want to elaborate them. Why is it convenient to shop online? Perhaps because, as you've mentioned a while ago, uh, people don't have to go to different stores. Okay, so no need for people people to go to the to many different shops. Okay, to get um, to to or to purchase what they need. Purchase what they need, and uh, we can uh, give examples. Okay, what are the kinds of products that, I'm sorry, what, uh, what conveniences do you get from online shopping? Everything is just within a tap on a device's touch screen or, you know, right? Everything is very easy. Okay, uh, delivered right to one's doorstep or to uh, customer's doorsteps, right? What else are the conveniences, right? Online payment gateways, yeah right? One click and you're able to buy everything, right? So what? People are able to save time and effort and they're able to also enjoy a hassle-free shopping experience, I think. Right. Now, um, let's talk about the wide variety of uh, choices that you get from uh, shopping online. Well, uh, there are um, many uh, online merchants, that sell various types of products. Some of these products are not even available in malls, okay? Some which might not be available in physical stores, all right? Can you give me some examples, perhaps, of what you can buy online? So some, some mentioned items of clothing, clothes, what else, right? Um, a few people mentioned some items they can buy online. Can you give me some examples of items that you're buying mostly online? Clothes, uh, what else? Apart from clothes, guys. Yeah, your essentials, okay? Like your hygiene products, groceries, yes. You can buy online, 
All right. Uh, books. Yes. Solar lights. So that will be household, you know, uh, appliances or household fixtures. Okay. Household items. Beauty products. Right. So these are just a few examples. And of course, they are going to help you to expand your vocabulary. So what happens to you? then uh, perhaps uh, yeah, there's absolutely no need for you to hop from one store. No need to hop from one store to another, okay? Right, to um, buy the items that one needs. Okay, right, now let's move on. Um, you're unable to check the quality of the product. And in most cases, as you've mentioned a while ago, I saw in uh, some of your posts on Facebook that there might be a... Uh, difference okay between um, the actual item that arrives compared to the um, expectation right so some photos might not uh, present the uh, real quality of the products unlike in malls right in which people can thoroughly check okay the product's quality before uh, before checking out. So what could be the disadvantage of this? It might lead to anguish, disappointment. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So let's move on to the next one. It is sometimes unsafe, right? So why is it unsafe? Because uh, there are many scammers. So we can actually put that scams and uh, hackers, right? So can you give, or fraud? Yeah, instances of fraud, right? Okay, so what are some examples of this, guys? Credit card fraud, okay. Yeah, so credit card details might be stolen. Uh, yes, we also have some people who do not actually deliver the products, okay? So it's a, a complete scam, right? So, yes. Phishing. Yeah, so some people. Yes. Credit card details are being stolen. Uh, and uh, there, there's identity theft as well. Right? Because you have to input your personal details, like your address, your credit card details, your phone number, etc. All right. And, uh, you know, yeah, typical... Um, uh, um, uh, instances when items do not arrive at all, okay, when you order them, okay, great. So what is the uh, outcome of this, okay? So maybe some people are um, apprehensive, okay, to buy things online, okay? So there we are done with our outline. It's very important for you to outline so that you can write very fast because if you don't prepare an outline, usually that slows you down significantly. So anyway, uh, let's not delay. It's 7.48. I would start writing. The introduction is actually just a paraphrased version of your task description. So what you want to do with your question, it's 7.49, so I'm going to start 7.49 is you're going to change up some of the words. More and more people, right? there is a growing number of individuals okay, uh, are shopping online who choose to shop online instead of uh, the, uh, sorry, um, these days. So you could say nowadays, okay? There's a growing number of individuals who choose to shop online. Even without nowadays, that will be fine. Uh, com uh, in comparison or compared to the past. Compared to the past, okay. All right. There is now, there is a great number of individuals who choose to shop online. Maybe that's a good intro already. Let's move on. Uh, this phenomenon can be attributed to certain factors, but, okay, um, are there any disadvantages to online shopping? But uh, it's disadvantages or its uh, drawbacks uh, uh, cannot be overlooked. Okay, so I'm just going to edit this later. Uh, this is already a good intro. Took me one minute to write. That's good. Now we're going to head on to our first paragraph of the body, right? Okay, so first one is about the advantages or perhaps the reasons. So I would say one of the primary one of the primary reasons 
behind the increasing popularity of online shops is that, okay, and what is the reason here? Okay, these um, platforms or on, sorry, um, is that uh, it is more convenient for people to buy items uh, through um, merchants, okay, that sell their products on um, uh, uh, over the internet or in the internet, okay? Uh, there is absolutely no need for people to, what do we have here? Go to many different shops, okay? To purchase what they need. And all they need to do, they uh, all that is required, that is required is just a tap on a device's touch screen or a click of a mouse, let's see, right? And uh, in just a few days, just a few days, items are delivered right to, right, <laughs> right to the customer's doorsteps. Okay, right, so there you go. Um, this in turn saves people so much time and effort allowing them to enjoy a hassle-free shopping experience. In addition, we're moving on to the next argument right here, wide variety of choices, okay? Online shops, online shops offer a wider variety of choices for consumers, all right? What, what, what's the reason? All right, so we're just going to copy this one, <laughs> all right, and rephrase, okay? Many online merchants uh, sell products that might not even be available in physical stores, okay? Such examples of products people can buy, and we're going to write this um, example uh, clause right here, okay? Uh, including clothes, um, um, specific types, particular types of clothes, uh, essential goods, groceries, books, household items, and beauty, beauty, okay, products, cosmetics, right? So what is the result of this? Um, I think I've mentioned it a while ago, so there's no need to put this anymore, okay? All right. So let's move on to the next paragraph. We're going to jump right into this part in which we're going to answer the second question. The second question is about the possible disadvantages, okay? Right, so let's uh, write a transitional device. However, okay, there are also uh, disadvantages, okay, uh, to buying things or patronizing, okay? Patronizing online merchants, okay? Or online shopping platforms. Platforms in that most of, um, in most cases, okay? People are unable to check the quality of the products, okay? That they uh, buy. Um, there might be a difference between their set expectations, okay, and the actual item that arrives, okay, since photos usually do not present the real product quality, okay? Actual, I misspelled that, let's just correct that, okay? Um, uh, uh, what else? Um, uh, yeah. All right, and actual item that arrives since photos do not usually present the real product quality. Unlike in malls, in which people can thoroughly examine, or maybe uh, uh, you know individuals can thoroughly examine the product before checking out. All right, uh, sometimes uh, buying online can uh, result in undue anguish and extreme disappointment on the part of the customers. Now let's move on to the last paragraph, uh, sorry, the last uh, argument, okay? More importantly, 
okay um it is um it might be unsafe for some people to shop online especially when uh doing so in um uh less popular no? less popular right applications right uh since scammers okay right since scammers and hackers are able to victimize okay um some uh uh customers right uh, by means of collecting their credit card information phishing what else we have here identity theft all right and uh, identity theft and identity theft and identity theft on top of um the frequent okay instances in which people do not receive the item that they ordered as a consequence as a consequence right many uh, are now starting to feel apprehensive okay about um uh, uh with regard or no when when uh, it comes to buying things online or buying or uh, goods online okay so we're done we are now just going to con conclude okay so in summary and let me just end this okay although i'm uh, sorry online shopping online shopping has become a, a prominent or method of um, acquiring or purchasing goods, purchasing items for many people, many people today, due to several reasons. Nonetheless, okay, it is uh, but prudent for people to be wary Okay, of uh, the consequences, okay, negative or impacts, okay, negative effects or negative imp uh, uh, implications of um, buying or uh, of uh, uh, shopping for items online. Okay, we're done. Okay, so, uh, right, this is actually the entire essay. So certain, maybe I can use the word certain here because, um, you know, Microsoft Word is correcting it. It's 7.58. So we did this in nine minutes. Am I right? Okay, so that's nine minutes. Okay, so that's writing task. So now I'm just going to very quickly edit this um, entire essay. This is actually what we have written so far. There might be some spelling errors. Of course, the last step in uh, writing is you have to edit the entire essay that you have written in nine minutes. So I'm going to read the entire thing and edit as I go. There is a growing number of individuals who choose to shop online uh, these days, maybe uh, nowadays, okay? And uh, this phenomenon, and uh, this phenomenon can be attributed to certain factors. And then I'm going to put here, nevertheless, Nevertheless, so that I'll have more transitional devices, its drawbacks cannot be overlooked. One of the primary reasons behind the increasing popularity of online shops is that it is more convenient for people to buy items through merchants that sell their products over the internet. There is absolutely no need for people to go to many different shops. Uh, I use people already, so individuals here. Uh, to purchase what they need and all that is required is just a tap i'm sorry on a device's touch screen or click of a mouse and in a, just a few days items or maybe i can remove click of a mouse because we don't really do that okay uh just a tap on the device's touch screen and in a few days items are delivered right to the customer's doorsteps this in turn saves people so much time and effort allowing them to enjoy a hassle-free shopping experience in addition online shops offer a wider variety of choices for consumers Many online merchants sell products that might not be available in physical stores, including certain types of clothes, essential goods, groceries, books, household items, and beauty products. Okay, giving people, okay, giving people an option. Okay, or um, uh, many uh, options. Okay, 
All right, giving people um, uh, a variety, okay, a variety, uh, uh, a range of different options, okay? Right, okay. However, there are also disadvantages to patron patronizing online shopping platforms in that in most cases, people are unable to check the quality of the products that they buy. There might be a difference between their set expectations, I could just remove this, their expectations and the actual item that arrives since photos usually do not present the real product quality. Unlike in malls in which individuals can thoroughly examine the product before checking out, sometimes buying online can result in undue anguish and extreme disappointment on the part of customers. More importantly, it might be unsafe for some people to shop online, especially when doing so, especially because, uh, uh, especially when doing so in less popular applications. So we can just remove that. Uh, since all right. Scammers and hackers are able to victimize some customers by means some people, and then I have some here. Okay, so I would probably say it might be uh, unsafe for several, okay, people or unsafe for, for some, okay, to shop online since scammers and hackers are able to victimize, uh, easily victimize. So I'm going to write the, an ad, adverb, easily victimize customers. Um, uh, let me see, vulnerable, okay customers okay by means of collecting their credit card information phishing and identity theft on top of the frequent instances in which they do not receive the item they ordered okay therefore many are now starting to feel apprehensive when it comes to buying goods online in summary online shopping has become a prominent method of purchasing items for many people today due to several reasons nonetheless it is but prudent for people to be wary of the negative implications of shopping for items of this type of shop or this shopping met method okay of the negative implications of this shopping method okay so i'm done and uh, it's 8 two so we just edited for a little under five minutes okay so this is the entire essay it's 357 words done in let's see nine minutes that's the total writing time i'm going to also zoom this out for our viewers to see the entire essay all right so this is the sample okay so as you can see it's actually well written Okay, and it's done in just nine minutes. Okay, let me know what you think on the comment section. Thank you so much, Sir Brian. Now it's the turn of Miss Den to evaluate the output of Sir Brian using four criteria. So the first two are the ones assessing the content, namely task response and coherence and cohesion. The last two criteria pertaining to the quality of English. There's lexical resource in simple words, vocabulary, in the last criterion, grammatical range and accuracy. So Miss Den is going to new grade Sir Brian or give numerical grades from one to nine, one being the lowest, nine being the highest, no fractions, no decimals, just whole number values. Because the four of them have equal weight what the computer does is to get the average of the four. So now, Miss Den. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, to those who still stayed with us. Thank you so much, Sir Irvin. And once again, thank you so much, Sir Brian, for showing us and continuously proving to us that you are the undefeated um, all-time niner, quadruple niner that we have. You're a gem of niner of 9.09er. So for this particular task, I was just taking notes a while ago. Um, and to be exact, in terms of the time, Sir Brian was able to write this, at least um, for the others who participated also, I'd like to congratulate you because you guys are um, with Sir Brian as he was brainstorming for this particular task. It took you around four, four minutes and 57 seconds to do the outline with Sir Brian and to, to, to help him give the details for this one as well. As for the writing, it was exactly nine minutes and 58 seconds. And for the um, outline, or sorry, for the proofreading part at the end, it was exactly four minutes and 43 seconds, okay? I kept on saying, I keep on saying these um 
times or num numbers of minutes, but please do not be intimidated by this, okay? It's Sir Brian who is doing this. So he's been doing this for more than 10 years already. Um, so I just want to say to you guys is um, you've been with Sir Brian when he was actually planning out this um, particular task. So it means to say that come exam day, you can actually do this also. You can channel his brain cells. Your brain, his brain cells cannot be with you, but you can just channel his brain cells and his strengths. No? Um, and I want you to believe in yourselves also that you have, um, you have what it takes to be able to do this as well. In terms of the time, it's not actually, um, do not put pressure on yourself that you need to write in just nine minutes also. All you have to do is you have to manage your time in such a way that for the 60 minutes, you'll be able to finish writing task one and writing task two. So that's all it takes. In terms of strategies, you can strategize for yourself, okay, um, for this one. And then um, as you can look closely for the four criteria, so namely we have, um, I will be sharing with you guys the task description. Okay, I'm sharing this because I want you guys to actually know what is asked of you when it comes to the writing task, okay? Um, as a smart examinee or as a smart reviewer, you have to actually um, plan everything out in such a way that you do not only need to know the strategies, but you also need to know what is asked of you. If, if your grade that you are achieving or your target grade is around 7.0, you need to know you need to know how you are going to get a 7.0 um, considering the four criteria that you have. So namely, you are being measured as to your task achievement or your task response. You're also being measured for your coherence and cohesion, as well as your lexical resource or your vocabulary. And lastly, you're being measured in grammar and accuracy. Okay. So as Sir Philip mentioned, it doesn't mean to say that if you're four in one criteria, it will all, um, it will be the sole basis of your score. So it means to say that since you have four criteria which are equally given 25% each um, of your, your score, um, you can actually um, look at the other criteria, probably if one of your strengths is grammar, but then again, you have a hard time when it comes to vocabulary, probably you can focus on um, grammar more. You can improve on your sentence construction, or maybe you can focus on task achievement and task response, as well as for the other um, remaining criteria, which is coherence and cohesion. So basically, that's it. You do not have to be overwhelmed. And I, as I was looking at the comments, I kept on seeing uh, about Sir Brian's grammar um, and his choice of words, his vocabulary. Actually, all these things um, is a matter of, um, it's a combination of all the four criteria. So you do not need to feel saddened by one um, weakness because all the other criteria might be your strength. Okay, so as we look at the task achievement and the task response, so Ryan, can I just request for us to go back to the question? Uh, yes. All right, so there, looking at the question for task response, it only means to say that um, let's look at the average score that typically is the, the target for, for most examinees. It's a seven, all right? So if you're going to have a seven for task response, it means, it means to say that you have to address all parts of the tasks. And in addressing all parts of the task, if you have received a question like this, wherein you have two questions, the first question is asking why, or it's asking for a reason, you have to have a paragraph that provides a reason. Next, on the second question, it's saying or it's asking, do you does it have any disadvantage? Does online shopping have has any disadvantage? You have to present clearly if there is a disadvantage. Okay. Um, if some of you believe that there is no disadvantage, it's okay. It's okay. You can say clearly that there is no disadvantage because the question, as you look closely, are there any disadvantage to online shopping? So that is a type of question which is um, a close-ended question which is answerable by a yes or a no. Um, in, just, in this particular type of example that was written by Sir Brian, his inherent answer for this one is yes, there are disadvantages to online shopping and that was what he um, he has written in uh, the second paragraph. But if your answer is there are no disadvantages, 
it's okay to present to present your side that there is no disadvantage. You will not be judged according to your opinion, but you will be judged according to how you presented your stand that for you, there is no disadvantage of online shopping. If you're like Tita Small, who <laughs> thinks that shopping is the source of happiness, well and good, go, defend it. It's just that in terms of task response, you have to present clearly also why you think there is no disadvantage. Correct? Okay, because another um, another descriptor here for a seven in task response is that you have to present um, a clear position, a clear position throughout your response, and you must be able to extend your ideas. You have to present it well, um, and your idea should be linked together as well. And sometimes, although there are tendencies for you to generalize your answers, um, it's okay. Um, you can still get a seven for this one. It's just that for this case, there's no generalization because it's as specific as it can get. You can look at um, how it was written uh, up until the examples, very good examples, clear examples. And as you can see, um, yeah, Sir Brian request for the example part for uh, the par body paragraphs. As you can look as the, at the examples, yeah, the examples are actually um, what we keep on saying at Niner is the goal for you is to be able to provide first an example that is number one, it should be a global example. It should be something that is relatable, whether your examiner is an Australian, is coming from New Zealand, is a British examiner, it should be something that is relatable to them. If you cannot give a relatable example or a global example, then you can go um, down one notch, give a local example. And then if you still cannot think of um, a global or a local example, that is the only time that you will be able or that you should uh, write, uh, what they call this, uh, a personal example. Some people ask this question, why are they going to give, uh, why is it not allowed to give a personal example? While in the instructions, it was clearly stated that you can actually give, give relevant um, explanations or examples from your personal experience or your own knowledge. It's okay to give a personal example, but please, please, please keep and prioritize in your global examples and your local examples. How will you be able to do that? Read. Read. Again, borrowing Sir Philip's um, golden rule about writing, you cannot write or you cannot actually say what you do not know. So keep on reading and reading and reading. All right. Um, all right. And then in terms of, uh, so there, there you go. That's your task achievement. As you notice, when you look at the sentences of Sir Brian, he has uh, roughly around, in terms of the count of sentences, it's around um, two arguments per body paragraph. Um, did you notice that? First argument was the reason. So the primary reason is it's more convenient. And the second example or the second reason is um, what you call this? Wide variety of choices for the consumers. Now at Niner, what we typically say for you guys for the pattern of writing, you have to present an argument, a reason, an example, and then a so what. Now, ideally, if you're just a beginner uh, writer, you can have one sentence for each. One sentence for argument, reason, example, and then so on. But since Sir Brian is Sir Brian, okay, in his example, sometimes his argument and his reason belongs to one sentence already. But you can still clearly see there that his argument of having, um, of experiencing convenience because of online shopping was clearly explained as well in the succeeding sentences. So if, for example, let's read the first argument, uh, more convenient for people to buy items through merchants that sell their items um, online or through the internet. Ask the question, if you're the writer, uh, ask the question, what do you mean by it's more convenient? Well, in what way is it more convenient? Your second sentence should answer the question, what do you mean by convenience? So if you read the second sentence, it's absolute, there's absolutely no need to go out and then they can purchase what they want. Um, you can just tap um, your finger on your device screen and then the item will be there. And plus, it will be, be delivered at your doorstep. So actually, this part is a combination of an explanation and giving examples to why is it convenient. All right. And in the end, uh, towards the end, uh, the sentence that begins with this in turn, so that's actually the so what. So in turn, ask yourself, ano ba, 
what's the help? Ano ngayon? Ano ngayon if it's convenient? So provide an effect of the argument that you've provided. And Sir Brian did that. He mentioned that since the people do not need to go out anymore, in turn, it saves so much time and effort. So because of the hassle-free shopping. Okay, so that's the, the last portion of the first argument. That's just the first argument. Next, the second argument, if you look closely, there is just around two, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, just two sentences for the second argument. Um, in addition, wide variety of choices. But if you look at the last sentence, this will actually help him score um, higher uh, no, not higher. Help him have a perfect score. It can defend his 9.0 in the grammar criteria. When you look at that sentence, many online um, merchants sell products that might not even be available in physical stores, including certain types of clothes. So that sentence actually contains the explanation, the reason why many, uh, why there is a variety of products. Uh, available for the consumers, what types of variety of products are available. So that's your example part, okay? And in the end, the, the so what is still part of the hassle-free shopping. So more or less, at least in that um, example or in that paragraph, paragraph alone, the two arguments are well uh, described, it's well uh, discussed and well defined. So if you are the reader, you cannot argue anymore. Um, you will just be believing what he wants to say. Diba? This is an argumentative paragraph and you will just believe, oh, yes, that's the case. I agree, I agree. Even if you think that, um, even if you think that it's not a reason, you will think that, oh, yes, this is a reason. Diba? Okay, next. For the second paragraph, so when we look closely at the second paragraph, look at the first word that was used for the first, uh, for the second paragraph. There was the word, however. Why did Sir Brian use the word, however? Why did he use the word however? What was presented in the first paragraph? What was the presented in the first paragraph? What's the main idea of the first paragraph? Yeah, and the first paragraph is actually presenting the reason for that. So somehow it's presenting a positive side of that okay but very good chewy choco irvin very good guys yes advantages but since you're going to present a disadvantage already use a transitional device to introduce that um to introduce uh the main parts of your second body paragraph so that's why there is a cohesive device that contrasts the previous idea that was mentioned so in terms of the cohesive uh, the coherence and uh, the cohesion it's it has um an inter paragraph cohesion so from the first paragraph it's cohesive with the second paragraph because of just the word however right so it's easier to read as a reader also um, I would think that, ah, okay, so probably even if I'm not yet reading the content of the second body paragraph, I know already that it's the opposite of what was presented in the first body paragraph, which is correct. It's true. Very good, right? So isang word lang yun. That's just the however, okay? There are also advan disadvantages to patronizing online platforms, okay? The first sentence already contains one disadvantage, disadvantage which is the inability to check the quality of the products. Again, guys, congratulations. This is from your um, uh, outlining or brainstorming um, part a while ago. So you contributed to this, okay? If you ask your, the question again, what do you mean by this? Then that's the description again. Plus, um, towards the latter part, or towards the middle part, uh, the example that was written here, instead of pr providing an example of, um, instead of using the transition word, for example, or um, for instance, did you notice the word unlike in malls in which individuals can thoroughly examine the product before checking out? So that's an actual situational example that can that is relatable for everyone because regardless of whether you are in Europe or whether you are here in the Philippines, it's the same case for online shopping. That is a possibility. You cannot examine the quality of the product, not, un, not until it comes um, to you or not until you receive it. Okay. And for inter paragraph 
cohesion, right? So there's the introduction of the second argument of the second disadvantage. The What's the cohesive device to introduce the second argument for the second body paragraph, the second disadvantage? Yeah, so let's look. Ano kaya? Look closely. Yes, correct. What's that? What's that word? More importantly. Yeah, the more importantly. So it's like from this point, you are providing, or the writer, Sir Brian, is providing one disadvantage and he's elevating the advantage. Very good. Irvin de Mayakyak and Astrid Gale. Valdemoro. Good job, guys. See, you can identify the words that are used, the cohesive devices. So it means to say that you can also apply this um, as you write. Diba? So it might be unsafe. So that's the um, safety concern. Plus, um, as you look closely again, in terms of the sentences, there are only two sentences, but the two sentences are well structured. These are compound, complex sentences because the combination of the ideas are there as well. But look closely, the last sentence, therefore, many are starting to feel to feel apprehensive. So good use of your um, voc uh, vocabulary there. Good job. It's a very simple, um, so what? It's a very simple effect, but it clearly um, identifies that it's, a, um, a dis it's an effect of the disadvantage um, when it comes to safety. Good job. And then as for the conclusion, so of course, there is another cohesive device. In summary, you can use that. Do not fret for the cohesive device. Huh? It's important for you to use the cohesive devices. But sometimes I just we just receive questions about the types of cohesive devices used, whether they're going to use this, uh, let's say, a phrase, this five-word cohesive device. Sometimes it's not necessary. What's more important for cohesive devices is the accuracy of the usage of the device, okay? So there, there is the summary already. The, um, he, mentioned, he mentioned the reasons as well as uh, the second sentence, sentence measure, mentioned the disadvantages or the negative impacts of the shopping method. So all in all, overall, this will merit, of course, a nine for the criteria. I would like to highlight nine for all criteria, nine for task achievement. All the questions were asked. For, cohes for cohesion and coherence, still a nine because um, it actually uses cohesive devices, um, but it does not attract attention. When you look closely at the band descriptors, it means it says that if you're able to get the nine, you are able to use a cohesive device that does not attract attention. Um, and it's uh, skillfully managing the paragraphing. So in terms of the paragraphs, one idea is, uh, one paragraph is focused on one idea. Your first paragraph focuses on the reason. Your second paragraph focuses on the disadvantage. So it's carefully um, and skillfully managed. For the lexical resource, as you all know, there are certain um, words that were changed because um, during the um, proofreading phase, he was able to change words that were repeated. Um, so yeah, that, is, um, that is the benefit when you allot um, probably around five minutes of your time to edit or to proofread your work, okay? And then, um, if you notice also, I'd like to highlight, uh, for those who were watching closely or intently when Sir Brian was writing, there was a phase there in, or an instance wherein he used an adverb. I'd like to highlight this also to all of the students. Practice your use of your adverbs. Us Filipinos, we're not used to having adverbs that much, but ad, uh, adverbs will actually help increase your score for vocabulary as well. Okay. And then lastly, for grammatical range and accuracy, based on how the sentences look like, there is no error when it comes to um, subject verb agreement, capitalization, and punctuation are always on point. So this is definitely a nine. There's no question. You can you saw it with your own two eyes. Sir Brian is definitely a niner. True blue niner. So that's it. Thank you so much for showing this to us, Sir Brian. Thank you, Miss Den. Welcome, guys. So Sir Brian took the IELTS two times, okay? One academic, one general training, one in IDP, and one with the British Council. So in one of his two attempts, a 9 in writing, and in another attempt, an 8.5 in writing. He also took PTE, 
Pearson test of English where he got the perfect grade of 90 over 90. That means to say it's not a fluke. It's not by accident that he got the perfect band score. Why? In three English examinations, perfect grade in two instances and the second highest in the third instance. So what 9.09er would like to reiterate, you don't need complicated language just to pass the examination. What's most important, you are able to get your point across and you are easily understood. Now, before Miss Den will leave us, Miss Den, will you please pick your two winners? One for the buy one, take 60 abroad starter pack and the other one for the free book. So while Miss Den is... Uh, Looking for her winners, the last part of our Facebook live session on the spot OET writing. For our healthcare workers who are still undecided, should I go for IELTS? Should I go for OET? Earlier, you saw Sir Philip perform differently based on the, uh, the expectations of examiners and interlocutors in these two English examinations. So now we're going to move on to that part after Miss Den announces her two lucky winners on the spot OET writing to help you decide, hmm, should I go for IELTS or OET? Miss Den? You're on mute. <laughs> First winner for the review um, package is Miss Monica Kayabia, Monica Lynn Kayabiab Fernandez. Congratulations. So, Ms. Den, can you take note of that? Because some of them already messaged me and I have to double check with the lecturer. So, which package did a particular person uh, win? Is it the book or the Only for Life package? Okay. What about the second winner? The second winner for the book is Ms. Christine Rivera. Congratulations. Thank you for tonight, Ms. Den. Now, we move on to the last part. Sir Philip will initially talk about OET writing and how this one is different from IELTS writing. Sir Brian is going to do the on-the-spot OET writing and lastly, feedback from Miss Anne Espinosa. So Sir Philip, let's talk about OET writing. Overview, please. OET writing is quite different from IELTS writing. Uh, first of all, the, it is, the OET is a healthcare-focused exam which means that the tasks are quite different from each other. You are ex you're in OET writing, you have 45 minutes to write a referral letter. Um, it's profession specific. So as Sir Irvin mentioned earlier, if you're a nurse, you get a nurse situation. If you're a doctor, you get a doctor situation, and so on and so forth. This 45 minutes is divided into two, the first five minutes and the remaining 40 minutes. During the first five minutes, uh, the candidate is given what is called case notes. It's like a chart. It gives uh, you information regarding the history of the patient, what has been done so far, what is supposed to be done afterwards. Essentially, a document to help transition the patient from one carer to another. The, this letter is meant to be useful. Unlike in the IELTS exam, where the focus is really about the breadth and depth of the language, uh, ng English in one sense, and to um, brandish your language. Here in OET, it's really about the usefulness of your language. So what does this mean? This means that you, if the message is simple, keep the English simple. But if the message is complex, ah, your English has to be able to keep up. And regarding criteria, uh, which I am sure Sir Brian would hit with um, flying colors, the, as always, as he has always done. Uh, there are two kinds of criteria in OED. The, uh, on one hand, we have linguistic criteria, and on the other, we have communicative criteria. There are four linguistic criteria. Um, um, the first is, um, oh, sorry, the fir I'm so sorry, I am confused. There are five, there are several, there are different criteria. I was thinking about the OET speaking, forgive me. In OET writing, there are several criteria. Purpose, content, conciseness and clarity, organization and layout, genre and style, as well as language. You see that it's very different from the criteria that's used for the IELTS, because here in OET writing, the priority is to get the message across. 
So very briefly, we discuss these criteria in much greater detail during class. And that's why we hope that perhaps you would consider working with 9.09er so that we can discuss them in greater detail. But for now, uh, purpose is making it crystal clear in the letter what is supposed to be done. Content is about ensuring that the information needed by your reader in order to perform the care is there. Conciseness and clarity means that the information that the reader does not need is not put there. So content and consensus and clarity are two sides of the same coin when it comes to information selection. As you would be seeing later, uh, uh, case notes are quite complicated. They are long documents. And Sir Brian being able to pick and select which pieces of information are needed and which are not very much makes a difference in how useful the document would be. Once Sir Brian is finished with information selection, the next criterion is Organization and layout. Once you have decided what data to include, how do you organize it in such a way that makes it easier for the reader to understand what your message is? Um, this talks about paragraphing. This talks about the sequencing of information. This talks about the connectedness of the ideas that you choose to present. At the same time, genre and style uh, is OET's way to give credit to the particular ways that healthcare communication must be, must be done. After all, uh, what is being done here is a formal handover letter from you, the healthcare professional, to another member of the healthcare. So the work takes the form of a letter, a formal letter, uh, and therefore, this means no, no contractions, no symbols, no judgmental language, no casual language, no academic language, certain punctuation marks that should not be done. Uh, this means that action, what care needs to be done, must take priority over the person that actually does it. Because when we endorse, for example, in the real world, we don't really care who does it, but we, rather we care more about what was actually done. So particular aspects of that. Finally, language. Um, OET always wishes to emphasize that though grammatical errors do lower your grade, not all grammatical errors have the same weight. If the error does not impede communication, that is more forgivable compared to grammatical errors that do compromise the message. So, um, you don't need to be a master of language. You don't need to master everything when it comes to grammar. But as I mentioned earlier, the priority is communication. Um, so these purpose is three points and everything else uh, is seven points each for a total of 38 points. And Miss Anne later shall be breaking down um, Sir Brian's work and evaluating it in terms of these criteria. Something to look forward to, I'm sure. Thank you, Sir Philip. Well, earlier this afternoon, Sir Philip coached from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. And I'm 99% certain that Sir Philip has not eaten dinner yet. That's uh -huh. why we have to let him go. But before that, will you please pick two winners? Well, you're in the process of selecting two winners. I'd like to ask our remaining audience to suggest topics for Sir Brian's on the spot OET writing. So think of those that you're not very familiar with with or those that you know but are having difficulties in expressing yourself. So we welcome these suggestions. Kindly use the comment section on our Facebook live session. So after Sir Brian uh, finishes his on-the-spot OET writing, that's when Miss Anne is going to grade Sir Brian based on the various criteria in OET writing. Sir Philip, do you have your two lucky winners now? There are so many participative people tonight. I, I am know. having significant difficulties. I Would it be okay for me to examine them further and announce them perhaps later? So that sure. worthy ones get selected. Sure, no problem. Well, you can actually do that while you're eating uh, dinner. You, you can like, yeah, like yeah. you can stop sharing your video, <laughs> and then okay. later I'll just have to ask for your two winners. Okay, so let's take a look at the suggestions of the attendees. Okay, uh huh. Roxanne Mangat. 
urgent referral letter. AMES RMC or AIMS RMC discharge notes. Eliza Gabriel referral letter to a social worker. Adrian Legaspi transfer letter. Uh -huh. Jade Saldana Kabakuan referral for further treatment. Loressa Serrano, patient with CVA. Okay. Now, I'm sure Sir Brian has encountered most of those, but I'll pick one which I feel is very common in the actual examination. And that's the one which was suggested by going back. What's her name? Okay. Eliza Gabriel. Referral letter to a social worker. Sir Brian, are you happy with that topic? Um, yeah, yeah, we're, um, I'm pretty happy with the topic. Um, <laughs> and by the way, guys, um, all of those that you've mentioned a while ago, they are found in our OET writing book because we, um, I, I actually compiled that and made sure that most of the letters that you were you're going to write about including the referral letters transfer letters discharge letters letters to different kinds of professionals and as you've mentioned a while ago social worker and even to phys physiotherapists and to psychiatrists or other uh, medical doctors we have plenty of samples that you can digest from that book so, um, and since Sir Irvin shows social worker, I do have a question for it. Just give me a moment to load it up. So while Sir Brian okay. is preparing for that, well, I'll just mention the different types of diagnosis which are discussed in his OET writing book. So burn, pneumonia, arthroplasty, GERD, cholecystectomy, retinal detachment, carpal tunnel syndrome, osteoporosis, depression, diabetes, uh, amputation and surgical fixation, and various types of recipients, actually. Community health nurse, psychiatrist, retirement home charge nurse, general practitioner, uh, ophthalmic surgeon, physiotherapist, uh, adolescent psychiatrist, dietitian, but because Eliza Gabriel requested for a social worker, and that's the one that Sir Brian is going to use as his basis for his on the spot OET writing. The floor is yours, Sir Brian. I'm ready. Okay, guys. So listen up. This is actually one of the samples from the book. So I'm just going to very uh, quickly show this to you guys. Let me just uh, share my screen. All right, just a moment. This one. Okay, so I hope you can see it from uh, your screens right now. I, I, I'm sorry, it's quite small and it's um, in the uh, portrait orientation because this is how uh, the book is written. All right, so I'm going to read the entire uh, list of case notes that we have right here. Let me also zoom this in so that more people can see. All right. So this is what you're going to see. You are the charge nurse. Is this the one for social worker? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, it is. All right. It says a social worker in the title. <laughs> All right. You are the charge nurse at Lakewood General Hospital. Your patient is Mr. Zach Holland. Okay. And uh, we have a long list of case notes here, but when you're reading your case notes, it's actually best to start with the task. So ignore all of these and go straight to the task. So down here, we have write a letter to Miss Emma Mills, social worker, Lakewood Social Work Services, 84 Violet Street, Lakewood. So you are writing to a social worker. And this is not really a very easy task because normally people are so trained and so used to writing a letter to say, for example, a fellow healthcare professional such as a nurse or perhaps a physiotherapist or a dietitian or even a doctor. But this is actually a different kind of letter because you're addressing it to a social worker who is, an, uh, yes, a uh, part of the healthcare team, maybe an auxiliary uh, healthcare team member. So it is a little bit strange. And I know a lot of people will struggle 
with this kind of letter. And it's good that it was chosen today because definitely will benefit from this class, especially if you ever encounter something similar in your actual exam. All right, so um, we are now going to go to the discharge plan, right? So you're writing to a social worker, so it's very important that when you're selecting your case notes in the test, the words, or sorry, the, the keywords in the uh, discharge plan or any part of the case notes will be pertinent to the tasks that are performed by the healthcare professional or the person you're addressing the letter to. So in this case, let me um, ask you to just give me hearts and likes. Okay, so let's participate, guys. Likes and hearts. You, you give me a heart if it is relevant to the question and give me a like if it is irrelevant to the task. Okay, so again, heart for relevant and like for irrelevant. Is it important for a social worker to monitor the mental state of a patient? Is that the responsibility of a social worker? Is that the responsibility of a social worker? Do social workers do that? Oh, let me assess your uh, level of consciousness. Let me assess as well whether you are uh, having flight of ideas. Let me assess whether your language is um, a little bit off. Okay, let me assess if your behavior is not good. Is that the responsibility of a social worker? Do social workers do that? Monitor the mental state of a patient? Really? What is a social worker? Does a social worker work in the psychi psychiatric department? You know, in which you, or maybe, you know, um, in, in a department that uh, monitors the mental uh, state of patients like, like a geriatric home care? Mm, I don't really think this is relevant, okay? So that's the problem sometimes. You feel that something that is important is necessarily relevant when in fact it is not actually pertinent to the duties and responsibilities of the person that you are writing to. A social worker will not be as interested in the men mental health of a, a, a person. Maybe the social econ um, sorry, socioeconomic factors might be uh, considered here or um, uh, psychosocial problems might be you know, rela related. Uh, so long as social is still part of the, um, the keyword there, it's not really you know, monitoring the mental state of the patient. That's something that nurses would do, something like psychiatric nurses will do, something that a psychiatrist might be able to do. But I don't really necessarily think that social workers are uh, adept enough to identify whether someone has a psychosocial problem. So a referral may, may be uh, different uh, here. It might be referred to a different professional. A home visit to determine medication compliance, alcohol intake, and diet. Do we include that? Is that relevant? Give me a heart. Give me a like if it is irrelevant. Do you do home visits as a social worker to determine whether the patient is complying with the medications, whether the patient is you know, drinking alcohol, whether the patient is following the diet that uh, the doctor prescribed for him or her or the dietitian prescribed for him or her? Yep, this is not something that the uh, social worker would do. It's something that nurses would do. Nurses are the ones who do the home visits, okay? Introduce the local social worker, of course, because it's it's a social worker you're writing to, right? Introduce a local alcohol counseling service. Can a social worker do that? Like liaise on behalf of the patient, right? So can you know a social worker do that? Liaise with different uh, organizations that can help the patient. Can social workers do that? Give me a heart or a like. What do you think? I'm seeing a lot of hearts. Yes. Okay, social, I'm sorry. Let me highlight that yellow. Yes, yeah, social workers can introduce someone to the local alcohol counseling service. Introduce to a CBT practitioner near the patient's resident. What is CBT, guys? CBT. CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. All right. So the social worker is not the one to do this, right? Um, the social worker cannot do CBT. But can a social worker introduce the patient to someone near the patient's residence? I think this is something that is possible. So I might put um, a highlight here. 
supply of leg prosthetics from a local manufacturer, again, local manufacturer, which will be funded by interim payments from personal injury claim. Oh, so we have like um, leg prosthetics here. Can a social worker liaise with someone who can um, make that for the patient, right? What do you think? Is it the heart or is it the like? Typically, social workers are uh, there to liaise with different departments of the government or perhaps different services or different uh, groups to provide, um, for example, assistive devices such as crutches or front wheel walkers or um, whatever else, wheelchairs, right? And leg prosthetics would also be part of that, okay? So I believe this is part of the responsibility of a social worker. Continue physiotherapy program and refer to an occupational therapist. Well, the I don't really think the... A uh, social worker will be performing physiotherapy, so we strike that out, okay? Give financial advice and assist the patient in setting up a personal injury trust. Can social workers do that? Can social workers do that? You know, like, I can give you financial advice as a social worker and what you're supposed to do with the money that you receive for, from your uh, accident, and I can actually help you to set up with a bank a personal injury trust. Yes, this is actually something that social workers might be able to do. Follow up with a psychiatrist. Uh, are you the one to accompany as a social worker, uh, the patient to the psychiatrist? I don't really think so. So we strike it out. I think most of you got the case notes uh, correctly. So congratulations, right? Many of you were able to choose the correct case notes. So that's very good. Now, what you need to do with all of these um, actions that you have selected is to defend them, to justify each one of them. Why is there a reason? Uh, why is there um, a need for you to introduce the patient to a local social worker? Why is there a need to introduce the patient to the local counseling service or alcohol counseling service? Why is there a need for the CBT practitioner or this leg prosthetics? You, you will need to explain every one of these based on the case notes that you can find right here. And it's a long list. So help me out, guys. Of course, there are certain um, case notes that are always relevant. For example, the name of the patient. Oh, sorry. The name of the patient is always important. The uh, admission date, perhaps, or the discharge date, these are very important. You also need to put into uh, your letter your diagnosis, okay? Right, so there you go. But in this case, I don't think this is the diagnosis. I think the procedure is the one that is more important in this case, right? So what was done to this patient, it was an amputation. And it's uh, what we have here, um, yeah, fixation, right? I, I'll just have to look for it. It's a very long list, okay? So yeah, so we had the baloney amputation and an ORIF, a surgical fixation, okay, of the uh, fracture. Okay, so let me just look at the uh, diagnosis right here. Uh, yeah, he had the fracture right? Okay, so let's start. Okay, right. So date of birth is also very important. Is it important to note that the person is married? Is it important, okay, to say that the patient is married? Would you, would you give me a heart if it's relevant? Or if it's irrelevant, just give me a like. Okay. What do you think, guys? Is it important to know that the person is married? What is the impact of that to the case notes that we have, right? Ultimately, will it help, help the social worker? If the patient is married, will there be a need for separation here? Okay, so I don't really think so. So this is not included. Lives in a two-bedroom apartment with his wife and two daughters. Is there a need for them to change their residence or to transfer to a different um, location? There's nothing written as well in the uh, discharge plan for this, so we remove this, okay? Of course, the uh, diagnosis is always important. Past medical history, hypertension, is this important? I don't really think there's anything uh, mentioned about hypertension in the discharge plan, okay? So we do not include it as well. 
And then onset of chronic heavy alcohol drinking in 2004, right? So we have something that pertains to alcohol, right? A while ago, like an alcohol counseling service. So we can include this, right? He has seafood allergy. So do we include that? He has seafood allergy. Does it have any impact about what we have uh, selected in our discharge plan? Nope. So we do not include it. So again, give me a heart if it is relevant and give me a like if it is irrelevant. Wife is Samantha Holland, who's 35 years old. Do we need to put the name of the wife here? And whether she's 35, does, that, does it have any relevance? I don't think so. Although we could probably mention that uh, he has a wife <laughs> and two daughters, Alexa and Martha. Do we need to write their names? I don't really think so as well. How about this one? He has been unemployed since 2017. Is there a need for this person to find employment? We do not have information about this. So although social workers can actually help connect a patient to services that will probably uh, be beneficial for this patient to be hired, there's no mention of whether this patient needs to be hired, uh, probably because there's no immediate need for it at this time because we are focused on the rehabilitation first of the patient compared to finding a job. So maybe we can uh, leave that out. Used to work as a bartender. Is there a need for the person to change jobs um, from a bartender to something else? I don't really think that's relevant. Low income family because the wife works as a shopkeeper at the grocery lo uh, a local grocery store. Well, Maybe, but um, is this the reason why we need a social worker? Maybe, maybe, because this is a psychosocial problem. So I would probably highlight it blue. It means to say that it's semi-relevant, maybe, but not so much. Okay, I mean, working as a shopkeeper, is there a need for the wife to change jobs? There's nothing mentioned about that. Maybe, because this is a social problem, but probably this part here I will uh, delete. Okay. Alcohol intake of more than 24 drinks in a week since two, 2004. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. More than 24 drinks a week since 2004. Yes, because you need to refer this patient to an alcohol counseling service. And then up next, we have the recent gambling addiction. Oh, a recent gambling addiction. There's a need for us to um, refer the patient, let me go back to that, to the CBT practitioner near the patient's residence. Is this important, right, for a social worker to know that the person is actually gambling, right? That's why you, you need to probably refer this patient to someone who is an expert at helping this person overcome gambling. I actually think so. I think this is the main problem here. This is the main social problem. There's gambling involved, right? Not so much the, you know, the uh, accident, but so much more about the social problem that is present here in which there's gambling addiction and there's also alcohol addiction. All right, social workers help with that, okay? Medications, I don't think the social worker would even know these medications, right? So let's remove the medications from the list, okay? He was admitted to the hospital. Okay, so this is the story behind the entire thing, the reason why there is a need for, for the services. He was admitted to the hospital due to a pedestrian accident. Maybe we can include accident, right? He was struck at, the, at speed by a car while walking on the street. Yeah, maybe, right? Struck uh, at speed by a car. So he was hit by a vehicle, right? And so um, there is a need for leg prosthetics because there was an accident, right? There was an accident. And probably, you know, from the accident, um, there, there, need, um, th there was a need for uh, some surgeries to be done, okay? Some, some uh, operations, I'm sorry, some, uh, some operations to be performed, okay? So we're done with that. A GCS, 13 negative head, CT scan, uh, BPRR, uh, I don't really think that this is rele relevant for a social worker, right? I think most of you guys will agree with me that this is not relevant. Okay, so we can remove this from the list. Okay, brought to the hospital operating theater. It's very important to know what the surgery uh, or what the operations that were performed are. Yes, so we had an external fixation, although we don't really need to be as complicated 
with our language when we're writing to us a social worker because compared to a healthcare worker who would know what an ORIF is, um, this person might not be as familiar with the procedure. Okay, so let's move on. Nursing management in progress, post-operative pain, manage with morphine, via infusion pump, do you need this in your exam, right? Hard or like, hard for relevant, and like for irrelevant, I don't think it's relevant. Required full assistance in mobilizing, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, because uh, there's a need for, you know, a mobility device, okay? But let's read on, DVT prophylaxis, okay, deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis. I don't really think this is necessary. Refer to physiotherapist. This is for a physiotherapist, so probably a like for this one. Good overall progress. Yeah, maybe uh, semi-relevant, but I would not necessarily include it. And then uh, there was an amputation that was uncomplicated. Stitches are out by the 15th of October. Um, the person will not uh, accompany the patient during the removal of the stitches, I think. So this is not relevant. Okay. But the mood of the patient, he is sad and he is hopeless. Do social workers have, um, you know, uh, uh, or put relevance or importance to the mood of the patient, whether they're sad, they're hopeless. Is that the psychosocial problem? Maybe, yeah. So let's put that here. There was no definite diagnosis after a referral to a psychiatrist, but there's an increased risk for depression. Yeah, maybe. Because uh, we need to refer this patient to a CBT practitioner, right? Someone who can help this patient cope, right? So um, yeah, for gambling addiction and for coping, CBT was advised, right? Wife is worried that the settlement money for his personal injury may be spent on gambling. Okay, so I see the situation here is that uh, the one who was involved in the accident paid this uh, person or paid the family a certain amount of money for settlement so that they will probably not file a lawsuit, right? But is it important to know uh, whether the wife is worried that the settlement money may be uh, spent on gambling? Is there any relevance at all to the discharge plan Okay, regarding this one? We need CBT practitioner for coping and for gambling. And this is actually essentially the problem. So we can put that right in, in here. All right. So um, he also needs... And this one is not really relevant because it's some medication. So we can remove this, strike this out. How about refer to a social worker? Of course, it is relevant because we have a social worker referral. High protein, nutrient rich diet. Does, does that have any relationship with the social worker? I don't think so. Able to mobilize with a wheelchair and mobilization may be, may be relevant, but uh, it's not always important to put it because we are more concerned about the prosthetics, okay, the leg prosthetics, but we can put it as a semi-relevant, you know, um, information right here. Oh, sorry. Okay, so there you go. All right, so that's how you select your case notes in the test. Now, don't worry about not selecting everything correctly as long as most of the case notes that you selected are correct and you didn't actually include a lot of those irrelevant case notes in the test. It's not important for you to be perfect or flawless in terms of your case notes selection, but you should have very good control and you should know what is relevant and what is not. Otherwise, your letter will be extremely long and very, very hard for you to to manage. Okay, so the reason that this is small is I'm going to open my Microsoft Word application uh, right beside it. So just give me a moment to do this, guys. All right, I'm very sorry. Okay, uh, let me see if it's working. Okay, uh, there we go. Okay, so I have to... Uh, create another screen share, All right? So I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, um, write the letter uh, right beside it. So just give me a second to share a portion of my screen. Oops. All right, up till this part only. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we have here the case notes. 
And um, we have here over to the right our letter. Okay, so let's get started with the letter. So once again, what you need to do is to look at the task um, when you're writing your letter. So let's start with this one. I'm going to just make this a little bigger for everybody. All right, so just give me a moment. I'm just going to change the font size. Okay, so the person we're writing to is Miss Emma, Emma Mills, and her position is a social worker. And uh, she works at Lakewood Social Work Services. And then we put the address 84 Violet Street, um, and then uh, Lakewood, right? And then after that, we are supposed to write the date. So the discharge date perhaps is the date of the letter. So let's look at the discharge date right here. Where can we find that? Uh, just a moment, I'm looking at the admission and discharge date. I highlighted that in pink. There you go, it's 17 October, 2021. So let's write 17 October, 2021. And then after that, we will be writing our uh, subject. Okay, so RE, and what is the name of the patient? Mr. Zap Holland, okay. Mr. Zach Holland and uh, Holland. And she, uh, sorry, he is, how old is this person? He was born in 1984, it's already 2021. So how old is the person, guys? Let's compute, or you can just write the date of birth, but in this case, you can probably compute the age. So what is the age of the patient? Can you, can you compute for me? What is the age of the patient? Because you know it's more convenient to look at the age of the patient. So um, in October of 2021, the patient will already be 37 years old. All right, 37 years old. Okay, so let's move on. Dear, and then what's the name of the person we're writing to? Miss Mills, okay? Miss Mills. All right. If there is no um, name indicated, you can write the position of the person you're writing to. So you can write your social worker. But in this case, because we have, um, you know, the name of the person, then we will be putting the name of the person right in here. Okay. So let's start with the introduction, right? So I usually start with something already very straightforward so that I don't use up a lot of words. So instead of writing, I would like to refer, I would probably start with Mr. Holland is... Holland is ready or set to be discharged, set to be, or no, maybe ready to, or ready for discharge, okay? And uh, let's put the diagnosis, okay, after undergoing, and then um, the diagnosis that we have right here, maybe the operations, after undergoing below knee, right? Below knee amputation. What's that? It's actually right. Uh, is it right? Below knee amputation. All right. So undergoing right below knee amputation. Uh, amputation and um, left uh, or if internal fixation or um, what is um, what is this uh, lateral malleolus? What is this? It's, an, it's the ankle, right? So we can just use ankle, right? Ax, ankle fixation uh, in our hospital, okay? Is it a hospital? Yeah, let me just check. All right, is it a hospital? You are working at what hospital? Yeah, it's a general hospital in our hospital. And then after that, what is the purpose? What is the reason we are writing this letter, okay? So we are probably writing, he would, okay? be requiring assistance, okay, with regard to his social needs, okay? Right, so there you go. This is actually uh, the problem, that he has social problems, and these need to be addressed. Okay, so let's get started with the entire story. So let's probably do it chronologically. Not all the time will you do this, but in this case, we need to uh, lay down the context. No? So I think this is the most organized way of doing it. So let's uh, start with the situation. This was on 15 September. We need the admission date. So you could write on uh, September 15 or 15 September, Mr. Holland was hit okay, by a speeding vehicle what was that okay was hit by uh let's let's check all right um struck at speed by car 
Okay, so by uh, hit by a speeding uh, vehicle. Okay, and uh, what did he have? Sustained injuries. Huh? Sustained injuries. Okay, that um, uh, required, I, I used already the word required, that uh, needed, okay, to be, uh, uh, that needed surgical, that needed surgical intervention. Okay, all uh, right. So we don't need to put any more the names of the um, surg the surgery or the operations because we have already mentioned. Okay, and then let's talk about how um, he he was doing after the accident. So after the accident, it says here that he's already okay, right? Except for some mental problems. Okay, so let's uh, write that. Okay, his um, post operative recovery has been um, uneventful, maybe, uneventful, okay? Um, and ano ba yung nakalagay dito ng assistive device, right? Hindi na niya kailangan pala ng, assist, ng assistance, no? Because he's using a, a wheelchair. Parang nabasa ko yung wheelchair, no? Nakasana yung wheelchair? Able to mobilize with a wheelchair. His post-operative recovery has been uneventful and uh, he can now mobilize, okay? Uh, successfully, okay, uh, using a wheelchair, okay. Now, what is the problem? What is the problem? Okay, he is actually having some social problems. Let's um, probably put that in a different paragraph. So maybe I can just write, however, okay, he is, uh, or he has recently been experiencing, experiencing some psychosocial Problems. This is actually a very good paraphrase of what the what the problems are. Okay, uh, uneventful, and he can now mobilize successfully using a wheelchair. However, he's recently been experiencing some psychosocial problems. And let's put all of those problems. What were the problems? Alcohol drinking and gambling. All right. So, Mr. Holland, and let's start with alcohol drinking. Where is that? Where is the alcohol? Let's look for alcohol right here. Sorry, guys, because I have to scroll up and down. Uh, alcohol. Gambling. I This one. Okay, so he's sad and hopeless. And then he has alcohol problems. Where is that? All right. Ah, there you go. Alcohol. All right. So I will just probably say Mr. Holland, okay, is a chronic okay, alcohol drinker. Why did I say chronic? Because it was since 2004, okay? And has, um, when did he start gambling? Let's see, right? Gambling, let's see gambling right here. CVT advice for gambling. When did he start gambling? All right, recent. So it's recent. So I will just write, uh, and has um, lately been addicted, okay? To gambling, right? So this is a concern uh, for the wife. So let's put the wife right here. Where is the wife? So let me just search, ha, guys, kasi matagal. <laughs> so there, the wife is worried. Okay, so let's check that. Okay, so um, Mr. Holland is a chronic alcohol drinker, has lately been addicted to gambling. His wife uh, finds this ad uh, concerning or um, this concerning as uh, she uh, fears or she is worried, she is anxious about the money or the settlement money, okay? Money they received, uh, um, she's anxious about the settlement money, all right, they received, uh, which uh, she thinks might end up being gambled, all right? So there you go. And then let's talk about the mental status or not really the mental status, but the consultation with the, you know, because we need the CVT. So let's uh, talk about the situation about the psychiatrist. And I heard there's no diagnosis, no definite diagnosis, right? So there's no definite diagnosis for the patient, but there's an increased risk for depression. So let's put that in. All right. Uh, how do I phrase that? <laughs> Um, let's use in addition, although Mr. Holland, uh, psychiatrist, psychiatrist consultation, consultation, 
right? Did not yield any definite or any clear diagnosis, okay? We can probably put here, um, he is, uh, uh, he has, okay? Or he is said to have an increased risk for depression. And then let's put the mood connected, di ba? Yung mood niya. Saan yung mood? Let's search for mood right here. Mood. Saan yung mood niya? Sad and hopeless. Okay? Uh, manifested. Okay? By uh, feelings of sadness and hopelessness. Okay? Right. So now let's move on to the action. This one's easier to write now because we're going to head on to this part. All right, so um, just the actions, all of these, right? So uh, we're not going to introduce anymore to the local social worker because we're writing to this local social worker. So what is important? What is uh, supposed to be done to the patient? Okay, it would be greatly appreciated, appreciated if you could refer um, Mr. Holland to, um, to the local alcohol alcohol or to an alcohol to an alcohol uh, counseling service in um, in the area and a CBT practitioner practitioner ayan okay why is there a need for a CBT practitioner let's search once again CBT for gambling addiction and coping right so CBT practitioner Okay, uh, to help him address or uh, help him cope and address his gambling addiction. I'm going to just edit this later, ha? Huh? All right, so practitioner. Practitioner. Oh my gosh, I'm taking a lot of time. All right, gambling addiction. And then after that, the security, uh, sorry, the personal trust. Let's look at that. Right, so... Per the what's that personal injury trust okay so let's see how i'm going to write that uh please also give him financial advice okay um and assistance in setting up a personal injury trust okay uh, and then finally what is the last one okay kindly uh, also um, what is the, the next one? Uh, the prosthetics, okay? Uh, liaise or coordinate, okay, with a local supplier for him to be, for him to be fitted with leg prosthetics. Now, this one is the goodbye paragraph. We're done. Am I done? Yeah, I've actually I written everything. So um, we're going to give financial advice. Okay, so I, I'm done. I'm just going to write the final um, a sentence, which is the goodbye paragraph. You can just write anything. So you can just write, should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. And then you, you just end your letter with like yours sincerely. And then you can just put your title like nurse and that's it. Okay. So that's how you write for your exam. Now, let me just make this a little bigger and then I'm going to go ahead and edit my paper just for the benefit of all those who are attending right now, okay? Because there might be some spelling errors, okay? So let's start with the, uh, with the address and then the date, okay? We have also the, the subject, we have um, dear, okay? Mr. Holland is ready for discharge after undergoing right below knee amputation and left ankle fixation in our hospital. He would be requiring assistance with regard to his social needs, okay? Or regarding na lang to para mas maikli, no? Regarding his social needs, on 15 September, Mr. Holland was hit by a speeding vehicle and sustained injuries that needed surgical intervention. His post-operative recovery has been uneventful, and he can now mobilize successfully using a wheelchair. However, he has recently been experiencing some psychosocial problems. Mr. Holland is a chronic alcohol drinker and has lately been addicted to gambling. His wife finds this concerning as she is anxious about the settlement money they received 
uh, which she thinks might end up being gambled. In addition, although Mr. Holland's psychiatrist consultation did not yield any clear diagnosis, he is said to have an increased risk for depression manifested by feelings of sadness and hopelessness. It would be greatly appreciated. Okay, sorry about the typo. If you could refer Mr. Holland to an alcohol counseling service in the area and a CBT practitioner to help him cope and address his gambling addiction. Please also find him. Uh, sorry, please also give him financial advice and assistance in setting up a personal injury trust. Kindly also coordinate with a local supplier for him to be fitted with leg prosthetics. Let's count the number of words, guys. In uh, your OET, you should be writing around 180 to 200 words. And I'm just looking at the word count right here. Just give me a second. Okay, so um, yeah, let's um, look at the word count. It's 198 words. And I'm done with uh the entire um uh, letter okay so let me just zoom this out for everybody to see the entire thing so um miss ann is going to be evaluating this but probably from here on onwards only so from here onwards only so right okay thank you uh for listening and i hope that this uh has been a helpful um discussion okay Thank you very much for that one, Sir Brian. Um, although I, I think really what's going to be assessed is the content of your letter. I think it would be helpful, Sir Brian, if we can see the your entire output so I can mm -hmm. show it yes, to yes. our dear sure. students. Okay, so let's zoom this out. I hope that you can yeah, see. Yeah, there yeah, you no go. No problem, Sir Brian. <laughs> very, very clear and visible. Sir Brian, <laughs> um, is it okay? Well, I also already took a picture of your screen because when I check okay. output, I really like writing marks on it. So, all right, that's is great. it okay if so, I do the? Uh, if I'm going to do screen the share, share yes, screen? Okay. You yeah, can, you can. You I can think share I, the screen. I prefer that okay. one more. Thank you very much. Right. Good. Thank you very much, Sir Thank Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, technology. I love technology. People can screenshot. <laughs> yeah, right away. One moment. I am going to share my screen. Good evening, everyone. You're looking at Sir Brian's work. And would you believe that he was able to come up with the letter in such a short amount of time? So I hope you're still awake. <laughs> it's 17 minutes past the hour of nine. So people from the Philippines, I'm glad you're still awake. Okay, we have come to the last part of the class. Me trying to evaluate Sir Brian's work. Um, this, the most important part is really the content of your letter, primarily the information which is related to continuity of care. So that's what we call the key information, everything related to continuity of care, meaning that would be your action paragraph. This is what we call in Niner, the action paragraph. So that's going to be the most important part. Nevertheless, all the other parts are also graded under layout. So it's important to have all the parts included, um, beginning with your inside address, the date. So I think I have to kind of like take a look at everything. Miss Emma Mills, I don't know if you noticed it, but a lot of OET's model answer, they don't add a period after Miss. That's primarily because OET... Well, the model answers that we see on OET website, they are using British English. And this is kind of like a British English rule. So they don't really add this. If you are, for example, following American English, you would have to add period there. So Sir Brian is very consistent with the kind of English he's using. Even with the date, it's also in British English. So Miss Emma Mills, social worker, this is the date of our, um, in the job of our reader. Lakewood, it's actually, this is not so important Ms. Um, regarding Mr. Zach Holland. Okay, this one, uh, I think Sir Bry, just for this one, I think it would have been better if it was a date. I mean, the DOB, that would have been better. But nevertheless, that's 
really not important. It's not related to continuity of care. I think it's just related to layout. So dear, dear Miss Mills, Miss Holland, this is quite an interesting way to begin a letter. It's not the traditional I am writing to refer. I'd like to um, go back to our case notes here to check the type of letter this is. Actually, the case notes is a mystery. It's not indicated what kind of letter. So you have to be very careful. If you're not sure if it's referral, so don't say I am writing to refer because it's everybody's favorite. So this one is a good approach. Miss Mr. Holland is ready for um, discharge. You can always use the patient's last name um, in beginning the introduction. Um, full name, however, is preferred. Pero of course, the last name is also something you can use. It's ready for discharge after undergoing right below knee amputation. I really like how Sir Brian picked the right problem. So there's no definite diagnosis. So just the, sometimes the procedure becomes really the, the most important part for the reader, most important problem for the reader. So after undergoing, so now we have told the reader our problem, the surgery, he would be requiring assistance regarding his social needs. There's something I really like about this introduction. Uh, it's something we reiterate a lot to our students in Niner when writing about your purpose. It would always be good to make the, to construct the purpose, the introduction, specifically your request in a personalized manner. So for example, instead of saying he will be needing care and management, maybe you can talk about the type of care. He will be needing rehabilitative care. He will be needing care during his rehabilitation. So always add like an adjective to make your request personalized. And that's what we see, what we're seeing here, um, his social needs. So if I was the reader, I now understand what I need to do right from the start. Okay, we have clearly identified our patient. This is the first P. So when writing the introduction, we follow the PPP rule, the patient there, the problem clearly identified. And then lastly, our purpose. So all the relevant parts of writing a successful introduction were clearly indicated. And then we begin with on 15 September. Okay, now you can write the date like this. You don't need to add a year because the year is the year which you include here in the date above. So that this is something you can do. So on 15 September, Mr. Holland was hit by a speeding car. I really like the paraphrasing Sir Brian did here. He was able to communicate the information in such a clear manner without even um, without repeating the same words. In a way, we want to showcase our um, linguistic skills to our assessor somehow. So in, uh, in a way, we're not copying everything. So was hit by a speeding car um, and sustained. This is such interesting collocation, sustained injury. Uh, we have to avoid using had a lot that needed surgical intervention. His post-operative recovery has been uneventful. Take note, students, when you describe improvements in the patient's past, it would be best to use the present perfect tense. So here, Sir Brian is using has been uneventful, not was uneventful. So job well done there. And now, Mobile he can now, I, this is a lot, uh, this is something a lot of students would miss. The comma rule for compound sentences, which Sir Brian was successfully able to include. However, recently experiencing some psychosocial problems. Uh, I'd like to continue reading. Mr. Holland is a chronic alcohol drinker and has been lately addicted to gambling. So addicted to gambling, we have to be very careful in wording our social history. Um, because this is one of the things that are assessed under genre and style. We have to remain polite to our patient, even if the patient will not be reading our letter. So this is something I'm seeing here has been addicted to gambling. You have to be, you cannot use that word if it's not indicated in the case notes. So that would mean like you're um, being judgmental in a way. But we can see that one definitely from the case notes. I don't know if you can still remember it, but it was indicated there. So for example, if it says he goes to the gambling um, the area a lot, you can just use that word and not use the word addicted or addiction. But it's clearly indicated here, advice for a gambling addiction. So we can, this is not us trying to judge the patient. So this is just 
absolutely correct information taken from our case notes. His wife needs, uh, his wife finds this concerning as she is anxious about the settlement money they received. Such an interesting complex sentence, which she thinks might end up being gambled. In addition, although Mr. Holland's uh, this one, this is something we clearly emphasize a lot to students. Napakaganda po, uh, this although phrase, OED finds this very helpful because this is a subordinating conjunction. In a way, you're highlighting okay, the, uh, the more important part. So here, although Mr. Holland's psychiatric consultation did not yield any clear diagnosis, this is our subordinating clause. So meaning it's not so important compared to this one. He is said to have increased risk for depression. So this is us trying to tell the reader about the most, the more important thing, and that is the patient being at, uh, at risk for depression, manifesting sadness and hopelessness. This, again, was not directly copied from the case note students. In the case notes, it says sad and hopeless. Sir Brian turned it into a noun, sadness and hopelessness, such a, an interesting skill to show to your answer that you're not copying everything and rewording something using word family, it would be greatly appreciated if you could refer Mr. Holland. So this is the most important part and you have to be very careful in writing your discharge plan because you cannot misinterpret the information from the case notes. So I, now I'm just assessing grammar. So I'm just looking at grammar. It would be appreciated if you could refer Mr. Holland to an alcoholing uh, to an alcohol counseling service in the area and a CBT practitioner okay, um, to help him ad cope and address his gambling addiction. Please also give him financial advice and assistance. This is a commonly um, mistaken word by students with the advice with the letter S and advice with the letter C, uh, but that was that's definitely correct. And set up, setting up a personal injury trust. Kindly also coordinate with a local supplier for him to be fitted with leg prosthetics. Yours sincerely. Definitely, this is yours sincerely. Okay, now I'd like to talk about the grades. I'll be giving Sir Brian per criteria. Definitely, for purpose, I think it's complete. It's personalized. I have all the important information I need for uh, the highest grade you can get for purpose is three. I would definitely give it a three. It's complete. It's short. That's what I particularly like about this introduction. It's short, just two sentences, not too lengthy. I'll give it definitely a, th um, a three points, an A. And now we go to our next criteria. I have to be very careful about this one, students, most especially with our discharge plan because this is me telling the reader what he needs to do. So for the sake of continuity of care, I have to word this correctly to my reader so I cannot give him the wrong directions. So for it, so I have to be very careful. I'm glad I, I have the book here. I, I sometimes use this, so it would be greatly appreciated if you could refer. So this is the first time. I really like Sir Brian's okay, approach earlier. His approach was we need to... Um, appropriately select the right information which involves our reader in lang um, in OET content criteria, we call this um, audience awareness. So you need to be aware of who your audience is and the type of job they do. Because not it's not because not because it's in the case notes doesn't mean you need to include it all. So you need to interpret really what my reader what does my reader need to do what is the scope of my reader's job so it was a good thing to do at the beginning you know to try to really um, think about the job the role of a social worker what's their scope of responsibility right like so there were some in, um, important there were some irrelevant notes even if they were in the discharge plan which we have decided to omit so it would be greatly appreciated if you could refer mr holland to an alcohol counseling service in the area correct and a cbt practitioner to help him cope maybe a, a bit of a comma there and a cbt practitioner to help him cope and address his gambling very good okay please also give him financial assistance Correct. And in setting up personal injury trust, very good. 
kindly also coordinate with the local supplier. This is something, this is the job of a social worker. Social workers need to um, liaise um, health workers, I mean, patients to other health workers, for example, or other authorities out there. So kindly also coordinate. That's what our social worker needs to do. And you know, now following our like concept in writing, for every action, there needs to be a reason. So I now have to look for the specific reason relating to my discharge plan. So first, it would be appreciated to refer Mr. Holland to a counseling, alcohol counseling service. We can see here that he's a drinker, okay, uh, and a CBT practitioner to help him address his gambling. So I think we have mentioned that one here. Please also give him financial assistance in setting up okay, um, injury trust. Okay, yes, that's because the wife is worried. Very good. And kindly also coordinate with the local supplier for him to be fitted with a leg prosthetics. Correct, that's something we know of because the patient is mobilizing with a wheelchair and recently on, has recently undergone surgery. So I think for each reason we have, we have a detail. So I'd like to make this clear, students. If you commit a mistake, like you misinterpreted the discharge plan, you can still get C plus or B. Ah, sorry, I have to reword that one. If you commit a mistake in the discharge plan, automatically that's band C. But for the that's only for the content criteria. So it's very important to word this correctly, our discharge plan for the sake of continuity of care. But if we commit a mistake in the detail, it's not much of a markdown. It's like maybe it's in between. Um, if, if you commit a mistake in the detail, that's not much of a markdown. That's still a C plus to a B. But definitely, if you commit a mistake here in this part, our action paragraph, you'll really be penalized heavily. So please, students, be careful in wording this area of your letter. It's like right, saving the best for last. Okay, so make sure you're able to interpret this correctly. So taking everything into consideration. This is quite an interesting case notes. I can't recall the last time a student told me they received a social worker on a specific test date, but it's good to practice with a variety of materials for a variety of letters. So first of all, for content, for purpose, sorry. Definitely give this a three, an, an A. I'll just say an A, that's equivalent to a three. For our content criteria, I have all the important information. Okay, appropriately selected with the detail, non, uh, we don't have any misinterpreted information from the notes. I'll definitely give this an A as well. For our CC criteria, there were really a lot of information which we decided to eliminate earlier um, because we think it's not within the scope of our reader so definitely i'll give that an a as well for our organization and layout you know students what's important to remember when it comes to organization and layout is to um, create very good paragraphing in such a way that your assessor won't have to guess what type of paragraphing you use. So it's not a mystery for them. It's not something they need to analyze. It's, it's something they would be able to pick up easily. So I think A, very obviously, that's about hospitalization. And B, it's about his um, social history. So maybe you, you would try to say that, oh, they, we should talk about the social history first, not, the, um, not what recently happened. But for us to just for us to be able to explain why we need to talk about this logically speaking we need to talk about the surgery first so it's not all the time that we have to prioritize it depending on what's most important sometimes we also have to think about the logical arrangement of the information so we can tell a good story about what happened to the patient and that's something i can clearly see here however i think I am a little bit concerned about the layout because of the DOB. That's just a very minor concern, but that's under layout. So I think for this one, I'll perhaps give it a B, a B to an A, uh, 
a B plus. <laughs> Something OET will not give you. Just my score here, students. So that's um, genre and style. Well, be careful. I, I, I think Sir Brian was carefully out. Uh, so there are a couple of things we need to consider when it comes to genre and style. Number one, polite language. Was Sir Brian polite in his request? Yes, we have. It would be kindly, please. And he's changing his polite expressions for every sentence. It's not using the same polite expression over and over. That's the most common mistake for students. They would simply use please, 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 please. So for genre and style, I'll definitely um, give this an A as well. And for grammar, okay, um, I think it was just very minor, just missing commas. So nothing really disrupted the meaning. Like Sir Philip mentioned earlier, there are types of mistakes. The mistakes that doesn't change the meaning, doesn't impede communication, doesn't impede um, continuity of care. So there, I would perhaps give this a grade of B+. plus. Walang B+, plus sa OAT, just in my own evaluation. So definitely, this letter would get a very good score. Okay, appropriately selected, um, correct interpretation. So I would definitely give this... Uh, like a B plus to an A, it's correct. Have um, appropriately selected all the information. So thank you very much. This is, um, thank you very much for this one, Sir Brian and everybody. Thank, thank you, you Miss Anne. If you read the comments of our attendees, well, We've been talking for three hours and 36 minutes to be exact, but we are happy that more than 260 viewers chose to stay with us and learn together. As we always emphasize, 9.09er teachers are not miracle workers. In fact, we don't promise that if you enroll, you will automatically pass. But what's our man mantra? We will work together. It is our duty to teach. It is your duty to learn. It cannot be a one-way street. That is why. Notice how Ben and Anne evaluate the output of Brian. Very detailed. And that's the point of one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's something that you will never encounter when you just watch videos on YouTube. Because YouTube lecturers cannot tell you if you are ready to take the examination. And these YouTube lecturers cannot tell you specifically what, uh, what areas you need to improve on. Now, we're going to pick uh, the lucky winner. I'm sorry, the senior citizen in me is sleepy already. I woke up at 5.30 a.m. And I have to sleep early because I have whole day classes tomorrow at PCAMP, España. It's my first face-to-face -face class in God knows when. And we've prepared 80 chairs tomorrow just to make sure that we can accommodate everyone and anyone attending the class, especially those who will be traveling all the way from the provinces. Sir Philip has already chosen two winners. His only for life by one take 60 abroad starter pack winner is uh, Jade, Jade Saldana, Jade Saldana yeah. Kabankungan. 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 Okay. That she's very active. Yes. And then the winner for the free book, Sir Philip, Charm Mabolo. Congratulations, Jade, Saldana, Kabakungan, and Charm Mabolo. Thank you for joining us tonight, Sir Philip. What about Miss Anne? Your two winners, please. So, I'd like to pick somebody who's still online. Of course. So, I, I noticed that there, there's a, a name that has appeared a lot. Sheena Marie Villar. And my name is also Sheena, so I may be biased. But Sheena has been so participative in the chat box, comment box a lot. So I think she uh, she's deserving of the Which, which prize are you going to give her? The buy one take 60 abroad starter pack only for life? I think I'll give her the six um, buy one 60 starter pack for life. And, and she'll enjoy like... it because she's based in Italy. Oh. Yeah, oh, I've read I it for the comment section. Congratulations, Sheena Marie Villar from Italy. You are the winner chosen by Miss Anne. What about the free book winner? 
So there's been a student who's been part, um, participating a lot. I've seen her comments on the chat box most of the time. So I'd like to give it to Meloy Delfin. Congratulations. So those are my two winners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Anne. You know what? Miss Anne is very hardworking. She handled the 1 to 4 p.m. class. She handled the 4 to 6 p.m. writing practice. And she's with us since 6 p.m. She's based in... Where are you right now? Are you in Samar? Are you in Leyte? I'm in a, a, a city in... I'm in Haro. It's a town in Leyte. Leite, okay. So, good evening, Leite. Good night, Leite. Please rest, Miss Anne. Thank you for tonight. What about Sir Brian's two winners? Uh, sir, I'll just be choosing the ones who tagged um, a lot of friends. Uh, and uh, I will be choosing Archie DL for the book winner. And um, for the buy one, take uh, 60, a, a broad starter pack, I would be choosing Mikey Rico. Okay, congratulations. Now for the last two winners, buy one, take 60, a broad starter pack, my choice, El Espinosa. And then for the free book, I'll choose... Eliza Gabriel. I remember the name of Eliza Gabriel because I sent her uh, an OET listening and reading compilation because I'm the one writing their names, their addresses, their mobile numbers on the LBC sticker. So at least even if we have not met personally, I was able to reach you through my penmanship. So Three hours and 40 minutes since we started our Niner All-Stars Facebook Live session, 15th anniversary special. If you think that the content was helpful, go ahead. You can still tag your friends because this will be available on our Facebook page for everyone to watch all over again. This is the beauty of technology. You can always share it. Pay it forward by tagging your friends. So on behalf of 9.09ers senior lecturers, Sir Philip, Sir Brian, this is Irvin Temporal. Thank you for being with us in the last 15 years. And we are hoping to serve you for another 15 years and 15 years after that. Good evening. Good night, everyone. God bless.